it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Welcome, my dear friends, to Dr. Creepin's Valentine's Day Nightmare, featuring your good doctor and some of his friends from the Ration community. Now, a selection of stories for you this evening, some featuring me, others featuring some of the up-and-coming stars of the storytelling universe. So, after you've listened to all of these, please go and check out their channels, like, subscribe, you know the drill. Well, without further ado, Let's get on to our first story, which features your good doctor and Musy's modern dreadfuls. If a man wearing a grotesque mask hands you an envelope, do yourself a favor and throw it away by Hyper Obscura. I don't like parties anymore. <laughs> too many people, too many faces. I've been attending weekly therapy for six years, but I'm still forced by my subconscious to revisit that night every so often just won't let me forget. The thing is, I'm not sure I want to forget. This will probably mean that I'll be a broken mess until the day I die, cursed to periodically drown in bottomless depression and anxiety and paranoia, but it'll be worth it. If my story helps just one person, it will all be worth it. Back then, I loved parties. Dressing up, meeting new people, dancing, drinking. What's not to like? Well, I wouldn't say I was excessive, but I love to explore new things, that's what I'm saying. What I'm trying to convey is that I wasn't a stranger to festivities, so while you might sit there going, oh, I would have never done that, or how couldn't she see how strange that was, you need to understand that I've been to my fair share of weird and disturbing gatherings. It was a Friday afternoon, and I was already somewhat tipsy. I didn't have any specific plans, but I'd been invited to two different parties, I was trying to work out which one sounded most promising. The first one was a birthday party. Some guy that I'd maybe met twice. A friend of a friend. I knew there'd be free drinks and loud music. Some old boring stuff. And I didn't feel like mindlessly drinking that day. Well, don't get me wrong. I did partake in the occasional binge fest. But I don't know. I just wasn't feeling it. And the other party was strangely intriguing. I had no idea who was throwing it. I was handed an envelope by some guy I'd passed on my way to school. I lived off campus. He was wearing some sort of grotesque halloween -y mask, dressed like a businessman from the 19th century or something, and he just gave me the thing. He didn't say a word, just bowed down weirdly before he skipped down the street like a five-year-old girl. Truly intriguing. Now, the invitation itself didn't offer much in the way of describing the event. It was a simple note made to resemble yellowing, faded parchment that simply stated the name and address of the happening. Cologue of the expired Burgess, taking place at some location on the east side of the town. Now, I didn't know the place specifically, but I knew it was an industrial area, which made the invitation, if possible, even more intriguing. Oh, I loved a secret gathering, like some real cloak-and-dagger type shit. Well, that was it. There wasn't any question about it. I was going to the Cologue, whatever that meant. The invitation didn't say anything about a dress code or when the party started, but I felt like wearing my red evening gown for some reason. Maybe it was the aesthetic of it all that inspired me, I really can't say, but it felt important somehow. I spent quite some time getting ready, before calling a cab and heading out. Well, I wasn't sure if I was early or late, or if I was required to bring anything, but I felt confident I could wing it. It wasn't my first rodeo, after all. It took the cab thirty minutes to locate the address. I was sure he was ripping me off, but I let it slide. I was feeling, I don't know, excited? Perturbed, maybe. There were butterflies, or some form of bug at least, fluttering about in my stomach, that's for sure. I paid the cabbie and got out of the taxi. I'm not sure what I thought about the place, really. It was an abandoned factory, rusty and worn. A huge, ugly industrial eyesore. I guess it sort of fit the whole weird and mysterious theme they were going for. So I can't say I was disappointed. It was just a bit unsettling, I guess. I wandered around the building, trying to figure out where I was supposed to enter. It didn't have an obvious front entrance. More like a bunch of garage-like doors. 
and all appeared locked. I was just about to give up when I heard a loud metallic clanking just ahead. Someone was opening one of the doors. I sort of jogged over there, afraid they were going to close it again, but stopped dead in my tracks when I saw the person standing in the doorway. It was the guy who'd handed me the invitation. Same clothes, same mask. I hadn't even considered it up to that point. But what if this was all just some elaborate scheme to get me alone to... Well, you know where I'm going with this. He hadn't noticed me yet, so I just stood there in silence, going over all my options. I could run, but I was wearing a freaking evening gown and high heels. There was no way I could outrun anyone in my current get-up. Alternatively, I could sneak away, keep close to the factory walls, and make a run for it when I got out of the immediate area. I started slowly moving towards the wall, and more people started pouring out of the door. Men and women, all wearing masks. I let out a sigh of relief and smiled. A <laughs> masquerade ball. How interesting. I hadn't been to many of those. I felt safer knowing there were more people attending, so I quietly slipped out of the shadows and walked towards the door. The guy was still standing in the doorway. I guess he was some sort of bouncer or something, so I just showed him my invitation and headed inside. He didn't say a word. Just bowed down, weirdly. Now, like I mentioned... I've seen my fair share of weird gatherings, but nothing quite like this one. The vast factory floor had been painted black, with a red circle painted at what I guessed was the centre. Candles were the only source of light that I could see, and there must have been thousands of them. A single table stood in the far end, overflowing with assorted beverages. All in all, it was quite spartan, but in a good, extremely creepy way. I was impressed. I suppose it was around that time I started noticing the other guests. They were slowly gathering around me, tilting their heads sideways, like curious animals. And they were all wearing masks. The same mask. Well, not exactly. The same mask, but with different variations, I guess. Grotesque. Horrible. Twisted parodies of the human face. I took a step back, startled, my anxiety finally overshadowing the excitedness. After a moment or two, they started disbanding, each going their own way. I guess it was some sort of welcoming ritual or something. I quickly headed for the beverages. I was starting to lose my buzz, and everything felt so bizarre and otherworldly. I figured I would fare better with just a little bit of alcohol in my system. While I was sipping on some of the stronger stuff, I looked around the place. Where were the masks? Shouldn't I get a mask as well? Who was handing them out? I shrugged it off and just assumed I'd get one sooner or later. Maybe there'd be a ceremony for it or something. Fucking weird, isn't it? A female voice called from behind me. I spat out half a mouthful of brandy in surprise. She was young, around my age, blonde and dressed in a beautiful white and silver gown. I mean, where's our masks? Shouldn't we get masks? That's exactly what I was thinking, I said. I want, no, need a fucking mask. She laughed and poured me another drink. The other guests were sort of slowly skipping around aimlessly. I never once saw them stop. I mean, they weren't even drinking or talking or doing anything but weirdly hop across the floor. I'm Haley, by the way. She smiled. Oh, uh, Jean. I shook her hand awkwardly. Hey, how did you find this place? She waved an envelope around playfully. It looked identical to mine. Some guy gave it to me. He was wearing one of those masks. Fucking weird. But strangely intriguing, you know? I nodded thoughtfully. Something about this just didn't sit right with me. Even after five or six drinks, I still couldn't shake the creeping feeling of uneasiness. Well, Haley looked flustered, but fine, so I guess she must have had a few more drinks than me. Maybe I was just being silly, overcautious. This wasn't like me at all. We just stayed put at the table, drinking and talking, having fun. Haley was such a nice girl, and we had a lot in common. She was so easy to talk to, never an awkward pause. Well, I'm not sure how long it took, a few hours maybe, but at some point we realized we weren't at the table anymore. To this day, I'm still not sure how we got there. Well, I was drunk, sure, but I wasn't blackout drunk, you know. 
Maybe someone slipped something into my drink. I doubt it, though. I, mean, I was super conscious about guarding my drinks. I learned my lesson the hard way. We were standing at the centre of the red circle, back to back. The other guests were flocking around us at a steady pace, until they surrounded us completely. Grotesque masks everywhere, staring us up and down like puzzled children. I grabbed onto Haley's hand, squeezing it tightly, and she did the same to mine. The guests inched closer, stretching their necks towards us weirdly, like prodding vultures. And then it happened. The one single instance that still has me going to therapy. That is still stuck on replay in my mind. They spoke. It wasn't so much the discordant, hushed, gargling voices, though I guess that part was pretty traumatizing too. No, it was, it was their mouths. At first I didn't catch it. I suppose I was too shocked, but it suddenly dawned on me. Those weren't masks. When they spoke, you could clearly see it. They weren't wearing any masks. That's how they always looked. Their true faces. Deformed, misshapen, utterly repugnant faces. I felt my stomach churning as the realization hit me, and for the first time that night, I truly feared for my life. I can't tell you what they were saying, I don't think the language exists. I've tried to write it down, write down all the sounds that I heard, but it's all nonsensical gibberish. I freaked out. I panicked. I completely lost it. I let go of Haley's hand and just ran, screaming into the crowd. I don't know what I was expecting, but it certainly wasn't what happened. They let me pass. Not a single one tried to stop me as I made my way to the door. Not a single one pursued me. Not even so much as a head turned as I got the hell out of there. All I heard was Haley's screams. Agonizing, tormented, horrible screams. I'll never forgive myself for that. For running. For leaving her behind. Never. I don't know where I ran, or for how long, but at some point I was able to flag down a police car. The officers thought I was hysterical at first. Drugged but somehow I convinced them to come with me, to help my friend, to save Haley. We parked in front of the factory fifteen minutes later. It was dark and eerie, and it was dead silent. The officers left me in the car while they went inside to have a look around. I swear those two or three minutes felt like they were a lifetime. I was trembling, crying, breaking down. When they came back, they had this annoyed, slightly puzzled expression on their faces. Miss, one of them said. There's no one in there. Are you sure this is the right place? I nodded furiously, tears still streaming down my face. I, um, don't know what to tell you, miss, he said. You can see for yourself. I followed closely behind them. I could still picture those masks, faces, so vividly, and just the thought of them had at me at the very edge of my sanity. We walked through the garage light door, but suddenly I had to stop. I couldn't believe it. Nothing was the same. I wandered around, perplexed. The floor wasn't black anymore. There were no candles, no table, no guests, and no Haley. At that point I was ready to accept that I must have hallucinated the whole event, that maybe someone had slipped something in, mushrooms or acid, to me. But, as I came closer to the centre of the floor, I noticed it. And I fell to my knees, crying. It wasn't a dream. It wasn't a horrible nightmare or some fucked up hallucination. It was all real. At the exact centre of the factory floor, right where Haley and I had stood back to back against those grotesque beings, it was laid out like some sort of messed up shrine. A beautiful white and silver gown. Our second story this evening features the vocal talents of Philia Noctis and Creepy Pastor Adam. 
by Mr. Charms 505, there was more than coy in the dead man's pond. My dearest Owen, I'm writing this to you for when you're older. I don't know how old you'll be when you read this, but right now, you're a curious and very bright eight-year-old. There are things about me, about how I think and view the world, that you may never understand. I'm not even sure I truly understand them myself, but I can't find the will to resist what my nature drives me to do. But you still suffer the consequences of those actions and I can already sense the sadness and anger behind your eyes when you can't understand my behavior. I'm going to be honest with you, Owen. I never wanted to be a mother. I believed my love for the world and the people in it would be put in jeopardy by you. Multiple tarot and palm readings told me that it would be best to keep you and raise you, so I decided to keep you. Even without knowing who your father was, even having to restrict myself to the typical bullshit that society pushes on pregnant women, even having to stop enjoying the very basic things like smoking dope and cigarettes and drinking to give you a fair shot at a healthy life, I decided to keep you. The nine months you grew in my belly were some of the worst months of my life. I was strapped with a burden that I did not want, and while I did nothing that would bring you physical harm, I could not stop the resentment that seeped from my very soul every moment I was pregnant with you. I thought about giving you up for adoption, but my readings had told me that I should raise you myself. Even with the emotional and spiritual support from all my friends, I was preparing myself to be miserable for a long, long time. When you were born, my spirit was thrown into even more turmoil. Now, it was certain that my life had a ball and chain wrapped tightly around it. I had this tiny human under my care now. I had to not only take care of it, but to do my best to raise it and integrate it into the world a world that was full of cruelty and malice and hate. I was going to be forced to shield not only myself, but now this tiny child from the evils of man and all the sins that he produced as frequently as his own sweat. I had a responsibility that I didn't want. Yet you came into this world not crying, not a single tear fell from your eyes. You looked around with a sense of wonder, and when your green eyes met mine, I could not stop the wellspring of love for you that erupted in my soul. I hated how instantly attached to you I became, but I could not help myself. So, my being was torn in two, feelings of love and hate, light and dark, swirling around in tandem. I would grip my teeth in frustration every night your cries woke me up from my slumber, yet when you would smile up at me during the day, my heart would melt, and all negativity I carried in me would fly from my bosom like a blackbird. Then you would puke on me, and the blackbird would come home to roost. Every day, this cycle of emotions would play out over and over, and it was getting too much, even if I loved you. I needed stability, and my thoughts of giving you up began to creep back into my mind. That was until the 27th of March, 1988. You were five months old then. Something happened that day that cemented in my very core my love for you. I wish something else could have been the spark for the flame that sprang up in my heart, as the memories of that day, that living nightmare, still haunt me to this very moment. But what's done is done, and it was a moment of fear, despair, and death that brought to light, for me, how much I truly care for you. You might know by now, but I don't like being tied down by anything or anyone. As such, it is hard for me to keep down a job and earn money. But I'm very good at finding niches that the average person doesn't think of, such as I can find opportunities to provide for you and me. A few days before the infamous date, we were living in southern Ohio. And when I say living, I mean living out of my 1964 Volkswagen microbus. I was doing some work as a waitress at a local diner to try and earn some hard-needed cash. I was getting agitated and ready to leave when I caught wind of a bit of interesting news. An eccentric millionaire recently had passed. His estate, about 50 miles upstate on the edge of Yellow Creek Forest, had been left abandoned. I used my natural charm to insert myself into the conversation, and I found out something very alluring to me in our current situation. 
I had no plans to break into his house and steal anything, but I found out that apparently the millionaire had a large pond in the back of his estate, and in that pond was some of the most beautiful and rare koi in America. Hearing that gave me a great idea. You see, I thought that if I went and grabbed those koi from the pond, I could sell them to an exotic pet seller for some decent money. That afternoon, I quit, grabbed my last paycheck, packed you up, and upstate we went. I remember that the drive was very pleasant. The sun was shining brilliantly, and the overall weather was quite warm for that time of year. I had the Beatles playing on my 8-track player, and you were babbling along happily in your car seat in the back. You used to love the Beatles when you were a baby, and I'd sing Octopus's Garden at night as your lullaby. But the energy of the whole situation was rapidly changing as I got close to the millionaire's abandoned estate. It didn't feel like an evil or negative aura surrounding us, but more of a primitive, primeval feeling. It felt more and more like you and I were leaving the territory of man and entering the kingdom of nature. Nothing was wrong with leaving the sphere of influence of man, but nature can be a dangerous place. But I was young and stupid then and I welcomed the wilder feeling rather than being put off from it. The estate was seemingly in the middle of nowhere. A long, rusty cast-iron fence and gate was the only reason I knew that I'd reached the edge of the property. I have to admit that even my positive attitude waved at the spookiness of the situation. But the thought of making decent money for us pushed me forward. Though the gate was locked by a padlock and chain, I always kept a pair of bolt cutters in the microbus. The chain didn't last long against it. I drove the microbus carefully down the old driveway. I could tell nature had begun to reclaim the property long before the eccentric gentleman's death. The trees that lined both sides of the driveway were wild and overgrown, their roots digging under and tearing away the old cement. The grass was long and overgrown, and vines covered most of the things that they could grow upon. I shut off the eight-track player to see if I could hear the wildlife that would be living in this wonderland of nature. I heard no sounds at all, just the low hum of the engine and the crunch of tires on that worn cement driveway. After a few minutes of driving slowly, we finally reached the mansion. It truly was an enormous, wondrous example of architectural beauty. Large windows, some of them stained glass, littered the front of the building. A large marble fountain, chock full of carved mermaids, and a large bust of Neptune was set in front of the front doors. The front drawers were works of art themselves, with silver and gold worked into intricate patterns. It truly looked like a place that someone with a lot of taste and money would live. But I had no interest in the building. I parked the microbus in front of the fountain and got out with a large plastic tub. The marble fountain was obviously not on, but there was still a decent amount of water in the large basin. I had a bucket also in the bus, and the plan was to catch three of the koi in the pond, bring them to the water-filled plastic tub, and then transport them to be sold. I filled the tub with water, gave you a kiss on the cheek, shut the doors of the microbus, and went out to the backyard with some bread, my bucket, and a pool skimmer. If you're wondering why I had a pool skimmer, well, honestly, I don't know why I had it as well. I can't remember when I acquired it. The pond was located in the humongous backyard, situated in the middle of where the back patio of the large house ended and the encroaching line of trees began. The grass was still dead, by the brown blades were overgrown and unkept, and I wondered how long it had been since any care or grooming was bestowed to this wide patch of earth. The pond also reflected the level of neglect, and I began to fear that nothing was left alive in the water. But as I got closer, I could make out faint ripples on the surface. And since the surface was completely calm, I figured that they must be caused by things under the water, and my hope was restored. Reaching the edge of the pond, I scooped a large amount of the water into the bucket, causing a massive splash and a large ripple that went out to the center of the pond before dissipating. I then extended the pool skimmer to as long as it would reach, broke up some of the bread into bite-sized parts, and tossed them into the water and waited. As I stood there, expecting a bunch of koi to come rushing to the surface at any second, a nervous feeling suddenly washed over me. I spent around a minute wondering why I was feeling so on edge, and then it hit me. Here I was, on an abandoned estate, 
surrounded by nature, with not a human for a good 15 miles in any direction, and yet everything was quiet. No birds sang, not even crows, no squirrels or mice or anything stirred in the trees or tall grass. It was like the place was devoid of life. To top that off, there wasn't anything at all in the pond swimming over to the bread pieces to eat them. Usually there would be fish all over them in seconds, but the bread floated, as still as the muck-covered surface of the pond. Then I saw it, large, bulging, fish-like eyes. They were poking out from the center of the pond, and they were staring right at me. They didn't look like the eyes of any animal I'd seen, but I could sense their intent on an instinctual level. They were the eyes of a predator, locked onto their prey. Fear began to swell inside of me, and I found myself dropping the pool skimmer and backing away slowly without even thinking about it. The eyes must have comprehended my attempts at flight, and all of a sudden, they began to move towards me rapidly, causing a huge upheaval in the water in the pond as whatever was attached to them swam quickly after me. I turned and sprinted as fast as I could, thinking only about how best I could escape. I heard a loud splash behind me, turned as I ran, and screamed. A towering, hulking creature was leaving the pond and chasing after me. Imagine the mottled green and brown body of a largemouth bass. Now envision its body to be the size of a motorcycle. On top of that, it had no tail, but instead two large clawed legs that stand the body at least six or seven feet off the ground. Couple that with two long arms instead of pectoral fins, each ending with a webbed hand that also supported long claws. It had four eyes, two on top of its head and two more where normal fish have eyes, and its mouth was filled with long, razor-sharp teeth. It wasn't particularly fast or graceful out of the water, but its long legs made huge strides with each step it took, and it was gaining on me very quickly. I was lucky I had started running when I did, or else I would have never made it to the back patio, and by extension, the back door, in time. I assumed the door was locked, but it had a waist-high window that I could easily fit through while still having the door remain locked. Without hesitation, I smashed the window, using all the force my adrenaline-fueled body could muster, with my elbow and in one fluid motion flung myself through the now open window. Seconds later, laying on the shattered glass with blood gushing from my elbow, the creature crashed into the door. It was solid oak except for the broken window and luckily withstood the beast's onslaught. I stared at the thing in horror for a few moments, finally coming to my senses and sliding back across what turned out to be the kitchen floor. Seconds before the creature tried a different tactic and reached through the broken window with one of its arms, grasping for me desperately, its malicious clawed hand missing one of my legs by mere inches, and it withdrew its arm and stared through the broken window at me. Though its eyes were like a fish's, I could sense intelligence behind them. Not only intelligence, but emotion as well. But the only emotion this thing was emitting was pure hatred. It wanted me dead. Maybe it would eat me to satisfy hunger, but I knew this thing from the dead man's pond wanted to turn me into a corpse. Slowly, the thing moved away from the window, leaving me still laying on the ground in shock. I remained motionless, still in shock about what I had just seen and what had just happened to me. Then a sudden feeling of warm liquid against my side and a rush of pain from my elbow snapped me back to present and I knew I needed to bandage my arm. The house was dark and quiet, and I didn't want to risk encountering some other horror that may have lurked somewhere in this accursed mansion, so I decided to look around my immediate vicinity to see if there was anything that I could find to help me. I was in the kitchen, as I said earlier, so it didn't take long to find a dish rag I could tie around my elbow as a temporary bandage. I decided to sit next to the stove on the floor hidden from view from any windows, and think about what to do next. I thought about trying to find a phone, but I was sure that the landline must have been disconnected by now. The only logical thing to do was just wait the creature out till the sun set. Then maybe I could escape by the cover of darkness, especially if that thing needed to go back to the pond to breathe or keep its scaly skin moist. So that's what I decided to do. Just wait in the kitchen in silence 
for the sun to go down. For about five minutes, I waited there on the floor, trying to be as quiet as possible and to calm my beating heart. But then, through the oppressive silence, I thought I heard something. I was still too freaked out to think clearly, so I focused on calming my breathing and my rapid heart as much as possible and strained my ears. There was a sound in the distance that I could only hear because of the broken back door window. Slowly, as I began to calm myself and listen better, I could make out what it was. Wailing. The loud screaming of a human baby. My baby. Then, something in me suddenly just fell into place. My mind's eye saw you, in your car seat, being leered at hungrily by that monster. It saw the creature break through the window as it had with the previous one showering you with glass and cutting up your sweet little face. My mind forced me to see this beast reach through the open window with its horrible clawed hand and tear your precious body from the car. My merciless imagination showed me this thing put your broken and bloodied body into its mouth and with one bite snuff out your short, darling, cherished little life. I knew right then, in that moment, that I was going to die before I let that monstrosity lay one vile finger on your head. I stood immediately, energy like I'd never felt before flowing through my body. I opened a few drawers, desperately looking for anything I could use as a weapon, but the best I could find was a butter knife. Then my eyes fell on the floor and to the large amount of shattered glass laying there. Most were little splinters, but there was one large one about the length of a butcher knife, and I immediately grabbed it and crashed through the back door. All the physical abuse it had taken allowed me to break it easily down. With the speed I never thought I was capable of, I ran around the side of the house to the front driveway where my heart leapt in my throat. The creature was standing with its back facing me, standing right next to the microbus. It was looking in the middle window at something, its hands pressed up to the window. My worst fear was about to happen, but I wasn't going to let this fiend have its way. I raised the glass shard and let out my fiercest war cry and charged the monster. I didn't have any specific plan. I just knew I was going to stab it with my makeshift weapon and tell either it was dead or it killed me first. Luck was on my side and the creature seemed to have had a hard time turning on its legs for it only managed to turn about 90 degrees so that its side was facing me and not its claws or teeth before I reached it. With another scream of defiance, fear, and rage, I jumped at the thing's head, swinging the glass shard down onto it with all of my might. I hadn't even considered that the creature's scales would be too strong for the glass to pierce, but I ended up not having to worry about that at all, for the stars aligned just right, and my glass shard went deep into one of the creature's two lower eyes. Disgusting black blood gushed onto my hand and arm, and the monster roared with pain, bringing its hands up to its wounded eye in agony. I dropped down next to it, waiting its counterattack, but that never came. Instead, it started screaming, screaming in absolute anguish with a voice that sounded disturbingly close to human. Still wailing, it lumbered as fast as it could away from me and you, back towards the pond that spawned it. I wasted no time and unlocked the front door of the van, I couldn't get the keys in fast enough, and over your screams of terror, I started it up and drove it out of that accursed place like a bat out of hell. The moment we crossed the threshold of the property, I parked and went to the back seat to check on you. Physically, you were fine, but you still screeched in terror. I picked you up, and you latched onto me, burying your head in my shoulder. I cried with you, realizing how close I had just come to losing you, my beautiful baby boy. I knew then that I loved you more than life itself, and I couldn't live without you in my life. From that day forward, I was going to try my best to be a good mother and never put you in harm's way ever again. Being a mother isn't easy, and I know I'm not very good at it, but I wanted you to know, Owen, that I still love you more than anything in this world. Maybe I haven't sacrificed enough for you for everyone to truly believe I'm a fit mother, but I face death for you and I would do so again in a heartbeat. Maybe I get flack from other parents for being the only mother not to tell her first grader that monsters don't exist, but they do, and I would face down an army of them with only my fist and teeth to protect you. Your laughter, your smile, 
your beautiful green eyes. They are what truly keeps me going in this life. I hope one day you get to experience a love this pure for someone like I have. Love, Mom. Our collaborative evening of fun continues with our third story, The Creeping Rainbow by Rose Black, as narrated by Papa Scare and Marie Lives the Horror. Recently I had an experience that I feel the need to post here. I like taking long walks on nature trails. It was my first time in a long while being outside. Being a solitary person, I was looking forward to experiencing the outdoors by myself, seeing as how not many people were out at that time. Whenever I go on this nature trail, it's usually a pretty straightforward process. I walk on it for a couple of hours, pass all the familiar landmarks, stop for a quick snack and come back the way I came. Things went differently. I was about halfway done before it was time to head back. I was taking a quick water break at the halfway point landmark, which is a mossy boulder. As I sipped my water, I took notice of something I hadn't during my other trips. The trail branched off to my left from the boulder. Curious, I took a closer look at it. My initial thought was that it had been made recently. The problem with that was it seemed too organic to be done by chainsaws or other machinery. I can't explain it, but I didn't get the sense it was new. I got the sense it had always been there. This confused me because I had been on that trail many times in the past and not until then had I seen that path. Naturally, I got curious and decided to walk on it. The sensation I got while taking it was tranquility. It didn't look different from the other parts of the forest except the leaves on its trees were a little greener. The path eventually led me to a small pond. Although it was pretty, I had been expecting a bit more from the path. Still, my water bottle was empty and the water seemed pretty clear, so I proceeded to gather it. When I submerged my water bottle inside the pond, It began foaming. Before I could react, a large jet of water shot up from it like a fountain. When I pulled away from it, a peculiar sight greeted me. I stood up with my now full water bottle and wet clothes to find that I was in a completely different place that I had been previously. It took a moment for it to register with me. This was mainly due to the water getting in my eyes and causing blurriness in them. When it wore off, I found that I was standing in the pond, but the area surrounding had gone from the forest to a field of flowers. The pond I was also on ran into a stream that went into a river. What the hell? I thought. Although I was confused, the surrounding area was quite pleasant to look at. I was going to step onto the field when something caught my eye. I spotted it coming out from a bed of roses. I didn't know what I was viewing at first. I can only describe it as being a rainbow that somehow had sentience and moved like a snake. Seeing it made me hesitate. It's true, everything I had seen there had not given me cause for concern. 
then again, I could not recall a time I had seen a living rainbow able to move on its own prior to that point. It slithered up to me, stopping right at the water, and did something that really took me by surprise. It spoke to me. Are you lost, friend? It asked in a soothing tone. Hearing its voice caused me to be less apprehensive about seeing it. There were a few moments of silence prior to me replying. Yes, I am. Where am I? Isn't it obvious? You are looking at paradise. I am? Where is this place? It's in a place where you no longer need to worry about anything. What are you? I am a being of happiness. I can tell you're stressed out. A single touch from me, and that'll be wiped away. Just step onto the grass for me and I'll do the rest. Its voice caused me to feel so relaxed. It was like I had taken a strong drug. Yet, there was a part of me that didn't trust it completely. Why not come to me? I asked. I would, but the problem is this flowing water. It would sweep me away. How do I leave here? I don't see why you need to. If you truly do, however, I can show you how. Has there been anyone here besides me? No, you are the first of your kind to come here. You are unique. Now, step onto the grass, and I will gladly show you. Don't you want to go home? I can tell you've been moving for a long time. Aren't you tired? Yeah, I am. I felt like I was being gently pulled by an invisible rope. All the while, the rainbow kept encouraging me. It kept saying to relax and let it help me. The more it spoke, the heavier my eyelids felt. Its voice was so relaxing. Yet, what was this other emotion I was feeling? Why do you hesitate? It asked me. I only wish to help. I don't know. Something is telling me to. The other emotion was so familiar. It was like a voice in my head trying its hardest to get my attention. But the rainbow had the voice of a friend who'd gladly open their home to you. That is simply your worry voice. The rainbow explained. No wonder you're unhappy. You constantly have it nagging at you. Don't you wish it were gone? Do you not wish to be happy? I do. Then all you need to do is come to me. I felt my shoulders slump as I started walking. The rainbow kept encouraging me. I was about to step out of the pond when a noise reached me over the sound of the stream. What is that? I asked, feeling slightly less drowsy from hearing it. That is simply the sounds of the river. Why concern yourself with such a trivial thing? It spoke in such a convincing tone. I would have listened to it, had it not been for what happened next. There was a part of the water that appeared more reflective than the rest of it. Look where you are. You are in paradise. It's no wonder you are stressed, having a mind that can't let you calm down. Its voice had a hint of agitation in it. Hearing it caused me to feel even less sleepy than I had previously. The noise coming from the river grew louder. I started walking towards it. As I did, the rainbow kept insisting that I stop and step on to the grass. I was able to ignore it for long enough to reach the source of the reflection. I reached down and grabbed it. Pulling it from the river showed me that it was a pocket watch. It seemed to be an old-fashioned one. 
I held it up and gave the rainbow a questioning look. I thought you said nobody else came here before me, I said. Well, I meant to say you were the first person I've seen in a long time. Now it sounded nervous. The noise was even louder then. It almost sounded like chanting. Don't trust it. What sounded like many voices speaking in unison said. Try as I might, I couldn't find where they were coming from. I knew they were coming from the river, but I couldn't tell what part. They are trying to lead you astray. Pay it no mind. The rainbow urged. Why didn't you mention them before? I asked, beginning to grow worried. I was afraid they would scare you away. It's lying to you, the voices said. No, they are lying to you, the rainbow said in response, trying to make its voice sound pleasant again, only to not quite be able to. Where are you all? I asked the voices, ignoring the rainbow. The dark part of the river. I didn't understand what they meant at first. Then I noticed a shadow that was being cast by a large tree. I went over to it and looked down. There I saw the owners of the voices. Within the shadow, I could see hundreds of faces that were anguished expressions. Not only that, but there were other items. I found a necklace, a locket, a flute, even some old-looking coins among other things. One look at them, I knew what that other feeling I had been experiencing was. It was fear. Humanity's most primal instinct. I felt its sensation spread throughout my body. The rainbow had been trying to give me the same fate as the owners of the voices. What did you do to them? I demanded to know of it, only to see it was gone. It It tricked us, I heard the voices say. We were were like you once. It It told us the same lie that it wanted to give us happiness. Really, It thrives by taking it away from its victims and leaving behind the items they cherish. Don't let it do the same to you. It only tries deceptions to those who spot it. With others, it can be quite sneaky. This caused me to become more fearful than I already was. Frantically, I searched around in an attempt to spot the rainbow. Fucker must be staying low, I thought. Beads of sweat rolled down my face, causing my shirt to become wetter than it already was. My crib tightened on the stuff I found in the river. Somehow I felt safer with them on my person. It was almost as if they were good luck charms to me. I thought so long as I was standing in the water, I would be safe. That was until I noticed, off in the distance, a log going over it that formed a bridge. One of my boots' heel was touching a rock that connected back to land. What the rainbow had been doing clicked in my head. I looked back just in time to see the rainbow slithering on the rock. It let out a hiss and lunged at me. I leapt back on instinct. At that moment, I avoided the same fate as those I had seen by a combination purely of dumb luck and timing on my part. You see, I still had my water bottle on me. Thing was, I had forgotten to close it. When the rainbow leapt at me, I panicked and dropped the watch. I happened to do so exactly at the right moment 
to block the rainbow from touching me. Then, without realizing it, I had accidentally thrust my water bottle forward, causing its contents to pour out. I heard the rainbow let out a brief shriek. I tried retreating. However, it was too late. This water splashed over its body. Coming into contact with it forced it to go into the river. Any pleasantness it had in its voice previously was clearly gone from how it spoke next. Its voice sounded like a nail scraping against dry glass. Its voice was filled with rage. You ruined me. You want to leave? Well, now you'll be trapped here forever. This was the last I heard from it before the river carried it away. Seeing it go made me feel as if I had barely managed to escape the maws of some large beast. This feeling was short lived. The instant it was gone, the plants began wilting. Areas of the ground were crumbling away into a dark void below. Essentially, I was about to go from the frying pan into the fire. I knew I didn't have long until the decay reached where I was standing. I've seen a video of a living crab in a jar. An octopus demonstrated his ingenuity by opening it up and ensnaring the helpless morsel within. I can tell you at that moment, I strongly identified with that crab. With that being said, I would be damned if I was going to end up like it. Shit, how the hell do I leave this place? I wondered out loud. We can help you, the voices said. Think of it as a token of gratitude for getting rid of the rainbow. Okay, you're welcome. Now how do I escape from this place? I don't have much time. I glanced over to find that two-thirds of the field had crumbled. Go back to where you arrived from and wait, the voices told me. I did as told under the assumption that another jet of water would shoot up from the pond. This did not happen. My panic skyrocketed when the rest of the area, save for the pond, crumbled around me and no water shot up from the pond. I yelled at it to hurry up as if doing so would be effective in helping me. At last, the pond crumbled as well and I fell into the water as it fell into the void below. At that moment, I wondered what fate would befall me. Would I be stuck falling into this void for eternity? Or would there be more ground below that I would splatter on? Both guesses turned out to be wrong. Suddenly, I felt as though something was pulling me upward. The next thing I knew, I could see the surface of the water. I emerged from it and coughed up some lungfuls of water. I had accidentally swallowed some during my fall. I found that I was back by the mossy rock. My body was halfway into the river behind it, which I took a drink of and used to fill my water bottle again before climbing out. I went over to where I had first seen the path, only to find trees where it had been. I thought perhaps that I had imagined the whole thing until I looked by the river and spotted something gleaming in the sunlight. It was the watch that was scratched in several places, but had otherwise survived the trip back with me. To be honest, I was apprehensive when it came to deciding whether or not to take it home with me. Sure, it had technically saved my life. However, 
I was too keen on keeping a reminder that I was nearly turned into whatever the owners of the voices became. Eventually, though, I decided that I needed to remember what happened and pocketed it. I pulled out my phone, which had thankfully been kept dry inside of my pack, and saw that only 10 minutes had gone by during that entire ordeal. It felt like I had been there for hours. I'm guessing the place I was in also messed with my time perception. Then again, without my phone, it tempts to be shit anyway, so who knows. What I did know is that I had enough of the outdoors to last me for a while. I'll probably go for another hike again in the future, just not on that particular trail. I do wonder exactly what that creature was. If anyone has any idea of what it could be, I'd appreciate it if you share it with me. Hopefully, that rainbow is the only one of its kind. I also hope seeing a rainbow will give me a pleasant feeling, more than it will remind me of it. The nightmares continue apace in our fourth story this evening. So yeah, I don't do drugs anymore. By the Jesse Clark. As read by your good doctor. So yeah, I don't do drugs anymore. I mean, I was never a heavy addict or anything. Never did heroin or meth. Dry crack cocaine once, that was, yeah, but I was only sober for eight months between that and when Eddie, an old buddy of mine, introduced me to something called K3. Against my better judgment, I took him up on the offer. You heard of K2, bro, he said, and he was already high. Spice, yeah, synthetic weed. Well, listen, man. I blinked. I looked at our mutual friend, Todd, then back at Ed. Listen, what? What? You said, well, listen, man, and then you spaced out. Oh, um, what were we talking about? K3. Oh, um, right, right. You heard of K2? Yeah, I just said that. He leaned in close. Well, listen, man, this shit is like K2 and then some. Hence the name K4. I thought you said it was K3. Todd stepped in. Okay, ignore him. He's gone. This isn't synthetic anything, Kev. It's something new. Then why did he call it K4? K3. <laughs> then why did he call it K3? He calls it that because the high reminds him of being in space or something. But this shit is like <sighs> another level. Oh, and it ain't cannabinoid nothing. I shifted in my seat. Okay, I'm not... I mean, you remember what happened last year, yeah? Yeah, yeah. No, I got you. Listen, though. I've done this shit four times already. Haven't had one bad trip yet. First trip, I was just like, whew, yeah, high off my ass. Nothing made sense. Second trip, I was like an astronaut, bro. I think I saw what exists outside the universe. Okay, what exists outside the universe? I said I saw it, not that I remember it, but it was wild. I was warming up to the idea. How long does the high last? Depends on the hit, and the quality. He held up a small bag of pills. And you know me, man. I only get the best. Muffin, his dog, growled from the other side of the room. Muffin, hey, down girl. Is, um, is she okay? Uh, she's fine, dude, he said. She's fine, dude, echoed Eddie. Then he started laughing. Is he on the stuff right now? I took it right before you got here. I wanted someone to be sober enough to explain it to you. Thanks? Thank yourself, person, you blittering snarch, Eddie said. Then he resumed laughing. 
Uh, thanks, Ed. Todd popped his pill in his mouth. I did the same. After a moment, he said, How are you feeling? Me? Fine. How long does it take to kick in? He smiled. I should be feeling it momentarily, my dude. Muffin started growling again. Todd clapped once. Muffin, shush girl, come on. I looked at her. She was standing in her crate, bearing teeth. The hair on her back stood on end. I don't think she's okay, man. She's fine. Hey, Ed, you good? I looked. Eddie was face down in the cushions of the couch. He wasn't laughing anymore. He was shivering. I said, Are we going to get cold or something? Well, I usually don't, Todd said. Every hit's different and every person's different. All I know is it's fucking fun. Okay. Well, Ed didn't look like he was having much fun. It doesn't look like he's having much fun, I said. Yeah, well, you know how your friends can be, sweetie, said my mom. Yeah, I know, mom. What? I said, I know, mom. I'm not your mother, said Pastor Lewis. Oh, I said. Sorry. He leaned in from where Todd had been. He looked concerned, disappointed. Had his elbows on his knees, his hands clasped between them. Kep, you really shouldn't be doing this. I know. Especially after what happened last year. What were you thinking? Well, I thought I could handle it, I guess. I stared at the floor. The way the colours on the carpet swirled in and out was always so mesmerising. It's going to be a bad trip, you know. I looked up. Pastor Lewis had on that old evil smile he always had. Or did he? I furrowed my brow. What? It's going to be a bad trip, he said again in a deeper voice. Todd said all the trips he'd had were fun. That doesn't mean it's impossible to have a bad one. Oh, Pastor Lewis doesn't sound like that. Man, who the fuck is Pastor Lewis? Said Pastor Lewis in Todd's voice. I blinked. Todd was sitting there, looking at me like I'd lost my mind. I cleared my throat, but couldn't feel it. Oh, my old pastor from back in the day, I said. Muffin barked from her kennel. It was a deafening, alien-sounding bark. Gravelly. Dark. I looked over at her. She looked at me. She barked again, but this time didn't open her snout to do so. Whoa, I said. What? said Todd. He was crawling on the ceiling, looking down at me in a way that should have broken his neck. Oh, call cool how your dog can bark without moving her mouth. Can you sit down? You're weirding me out. Yeah, sorry, Pastor Lewis said, before coming down and becoming Todd. And then Todd said, laughing hysterically, I am sitting, man. He was indeed sitting. I looked up. Nobody on the ceiling and no indication that anyone had been there. He was doubled over with laughter, howling, aching laughs. He held his stomach. Is it that funny? It ain't that, Todd said. The spiders in your ears are singing. I smiled. Oh yeah? What are they singing? Todd couldn't stop laughing enough to respond. But he didn't need to. I could hear it too. Dude, I said. It's a song from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Todd laughed even harder. Man, what? You spelled it wrong, my dude. What? Go back. You spelled dwarfs wrong. It should be dwarfs, not dwarfs. What the fuck is a dwarf? I scrolled up. There it was. Dwarves. Hmm. That's weird. <sighs> That's weird, I said. Todd was still laughing. Far harder and longer than the situation warranted. How am I seeing words I spoke? I asked. I grabbed the R in the dwarves so I could rearrange the word, but the R slapped me just as Muffin barked again. Bark smack. Just like that. A single bark. Sounded like Satan. I sat back down. Easy there, dwarves, I said. I'll spell it right next time, damn. Make sure you do, said Muffin. One by one, the letters comprising the word dwarves 
headed out the kitchen window. Dude, I said. Todd, the letters are escaping. Stop the letters. Stop the letters. I can't hear you, bro, said Todd in Pastor Lewis's voice. Or Pastor Lewis in Todd's voice. Who were they again? Fuck, whoever it was said, Come downstairs. I am downstairs, I said, before stubbing my toe on his bedroom dresser. I took a step back. I was in his bedroom upstairs. The place was a wreck. That's... Wait, how did I... Come downstairs, said Muffin, demonically. I couldn't see her, but somehow I just knew she was standing at the bottom of the stairs, on two legs, with her head upside down. You know when you just know a dog would look like that. Yeah, it was one of those times. That's okay, I said. I like it up here. He pulled one of his dresser drawers out, dumped out all his underwear and condoms, and put it on my head for protection. No way you're getting me now, you bitch. I sat down on his bed, but his bed was on the other end of the room. Oh, I said, sitting on his floor. I hurt my ass. Go downstairs, said Muffin from so close behind me she must have been inside my head. Get out of my head, I said. The power of the dresser drawer compels you. He was crawling on the ceiling, looking down at me in a way that should have broken his neck. Hey! He was crawling on the ceiling, looking down at me in a way that should have broken his neck. Stop it! He was crawling on the ceiling, looking down at me in a way that should have broken his neck. Stop repeating that sentence. What sentence? said Todd. He was in his room, at least I think he was. I don't know, man. I blinked again. He wasn't there. I could hear him laughing downstairs hysterically. Holy shit, I could hear myself say. I sounded distant, underwater. I'm not in control right now. I started crawling towards the hallway, and he was crawling on the ceiling, looking down at me in a way that should have broken his... I shoved the sentence aside. The letters crashed into the wall and melted. I kept crawling, but now my hands were getting stuck in the quicksand. Shit, I said. Here we go. I made it to the door, but the dresser drawer on my head was too wide. I turned it the other way, the only possible solution to that problem, and went for the stairs. Downstairs, Eddie, up and about yet again, was approaching Muffin's kennel, bent over, walking unnaturally, wide-eyed, mouth open, out of his mind. Muffin was howling and barking hysterically, but also silently. That's weird, I said. It's gonna be a bad trip said Pastor Lewis. You already said that, Pastor Lewis. I'm asking why I can't hear Muffin bark. It's going to be a bad trip, he said again. He was crawling on the ceiling, looking down at me in a way that should have broken his neck. Why is everything repeating? I asked aloud. He was crawling on the ceiling, looking down at me in a way that should have broken his neck. Why is everything repeating? I asked aloud. Don't drink water. Water, bro. Bro, said, said Todd, Todd, he, um, he handed me, me, uh, and I, I tried to drink, drink it, it upside, upside down, uh, down. The water spilled into the swirling vortex that was his floor. Oh, man, I said, I lost the water. Where did you have it last, sweetie? said Mom. I looked at the empty glass. I can't remember. Hey, Roy Rogers, what did I do with my water, man? Did I eat it? Roy Rogers didn't respond. He was too busy floating on an upside-down chair that was attached to the ceiling. Snarch, said his chair. Roy Rogers, who was also my Uncle Mo, tipped his hat. Oh, let me know if you find it, I said. I could have sworn I had it. Bark, 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 bark. Oh, it's going to be a bad trip, you know. Why am I just hearing Muffin barking? That was like an hour ago. I looked over. Eddie had picked up a kennel, with her still inside, and was holding it above his head. She was consumed in absolute and utter panic, and he was trying to eat the entire crate. He unhinged his jaw to fit it inside, revealing exactly 14,543 razor-sharp teeth the size of railroad spikes. Bark, 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 bark. Ed... 
Stop, I heard myself say. I said. I squeezed my eyes shut and shook my head. Ed, stop, I heard myself say. Why? His face was static, like when you turn your TV to a channel you don't own. Ed, put her down, and get that static off your face. He was crawling on the ceiling, looking down at me in a way I should have broken his neck. What? Eddie said. He dropped the kennel. Muffin yelped. I don't know, man, I said. Your face is all static -y. like when you turn your TV to a channel you don't own. My face is static, Eddie said through the static. He started clawing at it. And who's clawing on the ceiling, looking down at you in a way that should have broken his neck? That seemed out of place. I heard the words, but didn't see them coming from Eddie's mouth. In fact, Eddie wasn't even standing there anymore. He was in the kitchen getting a knife. Shit. It's gonna be a bad trip, you know. Shut up, Pastor Lewis. I know that now. Eddie started swiping the knife in front of his face. Get off me, Static, he said. Get off me, Static. I put the knife down. Ed, stand up. Wait, no. I stood up. Eddie knifed, putting the said down. Oh, damn it. I stood up. Ed, put the knife down. There we go. It's gonna be a bad trip, you know. I turned around. Pastor Lewis was at the top of the stairs, but it wasn't Pastor Lewis. It was a perfectly black figure. Pastor Lewis... Black slimming on you. Come upstairs, said the figure. It didn't sound like Pastor Lewis anymore, but it did sound like static, almost as if the static had formed itself into words. I can't. I have to save my friend from the static knife. Come upstairs, said the figure. Come upstairs, 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 ceiling, ceilings. He was crawling on the ceiling, looking down at me in a way that should have broken his neck. Neck, neck, knock, knock, bark, 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 get, get off me, static, 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 static. Yo, who the fuck is Pastor Lewis? He was crawling on the ceiling, looking down at me in a way that I should have broken his neck. Come upstairs, dwarves. Sweetie, it's gonna be a bad trip, you know, no, no. I was falling, I realized. Falling, falling, falling. And it was hot. Wherever this endless tunnel was, it was hot and dark. Well, that's a bad combination, usually, isn't it? I haven't been in many dark and hot places, but having experienced it, I can say I'd much rather be in bright, cool places. Help me, I said. I felt asphalt. Help me, I'm falling. Now I saw lights coming on from the side of the pit. Come upstairs, said a single voice from behind me that was also Todd, Pastor Lewis, Eddie, and my mother at once. This is a bad trip, Kevin, the voice continued. It's real and you know that. What you thought was real was the trip. Time, space, those are the illusions. This is what exists behind the veil. This is the nothingness that exists outside the universe. This is the nothingness that awaits you at the end. <laughs> no! Falling. Getting him to his feet. Come upstairs and get that thing off his head. Come upstairs. Join the static. 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 Bark. Are you okay? I blinked. Hey, kid, said the officer. You okay? I looked around. I was lying in the street. Concerned neighbors. Police cars everywhere. Most were in front of Eddie's house. Muffin whimpered in the crate next to me. What? What happened? Well... You're out here screaming, I'm falling, I'm falling, no. With a dog kennel, a dresser drawer on your head, and no shoes. I was hoping you'd tell me. I think I was saving Muffin, I said. Who's Muffin, the dog? Yeah. Saving her from what? My friend was going to kill her, I think. Then he tried to cut his face off because it was all static. Oh, holy shit. My now sober brain processed unsober words. Holy shit, that stuff was insane. Yeah, I'd say that's a fair assessment, dumbass. You're lucky you didn't jump off the roof. Can you stand? The officer helped me to my feet. 
I stumbled towards his car. Wait, I said. What happened to uh, Todd, Eddie? Are they okay? He looked at me. No, kid, they're not okay. This is why you don't fuck with this stuff. Now we have to clean up what's left. Sit there. He went off to talk to the other officers and the paramedics. Shit. Paramedics? Two gurneys? An ambulance? I... I came to a full 36 hours later in my own bed. As I later found out, Eddie did succeed in getting the static off of his face, along with the rest of his face. And the last I heard of Todd, he was in a straitjacket. Muffin was given to the shelter, and then to another family. So there's some good news, at least. As for myself, I was told the effects might never wear off. I didn't believe them at first. I mean, who would? How do you even process that kind of news? Fuck, I don't know. All I know is that the black figure is still standing at the end of my hallway, asking me to join it. I can still hear static. Our fifth story this evening is Would You Like to Go Back by Rick Dick Duck 123 as performed by Lady Spookaria and Creepypasta Adam. It all ended so quickly. I got up, I prepared breakfast for my kids, I kissed my wife goodbye and got ready to go to work. It was an ordinary day like any other without any special hitches or happenings. I would go to the office, finish work at 5pm, and go back home to my loving family. But it was never meant to be, because before I even realized what was going on, a truck ran a red light and T-boned my car. I didn't make it. There was no light at the end of the tunnel, no voices calling to me, and no floating above my own body realizing I was dead. I was instead enveloped by an inexplicable darkness and nothingness. It only lasted for a brief moment though, because in the next moment, when I opened my eyes again, I was in a brightly lit room. It took my eyes a moment to adjust, and upon doing so, I realized I was in a room which resembled that of a hospital. A woman in a white shirt stood in front of me, and at first I thought she was a doctor, but upon closer inspection, I realized it was a sort of working uniform, similar to what masseuses wear. The name tag she wore said Valtech Industries, and under that was the name Amanda. I realized that she had a peculiar looking green glowing dot on her wrist. Sir, can you hear me? I heard her call out to me, as if through a tunnel. What? I started, but felt an overwhelming sickness take over me. I turned to the side and vomited in something that looked like a trash bag. It was placed next to me so conveniently that it made me think they assumed I would get sick upon waking up. It's okay. This is normal. Get it all out. Amanda said, holding me by my shoulder. I emptied the remainder of my bowel contents and coughed a few times, before saying with a raspy voice, Where am I? Amanda helped me get back in the lane position and said, You're experiencing short-term memory loss. This is normal. You've been in the simulation for a long time. Simulation? I asked groggily, my senses starting to come back to me. You've been asleep this entire time, sir, she said. For the past five years, the life you experienced has been in the simulation of Veltec Industries. Wait, what? I asked, my mind hazy. I tried remembering what just happened. I was at home, I said goodbye to my family, and I was on my way to work, and then a truck hit me. It may take you a few minutes to regain your memory, Amanda said, but let me briefly give you the overview. You purchase the Veltec Platinum Plan, which allows you to stay in the simulation indefinitely. Save for the pauses in between when your life in the simulation ends and the mandatory breaks, you chose the parameters of the life you want to experience in the sim, and we put you inside. It all started to get back to me slowly. I still didn't remember my old life. 
but I remembered vaguely beginning the simulation years ago. But was it only five years? Or did I restart the simulation multiple times but didn't remember? I remembered getting attached to the machine, but anything beyond that was a blur. Amanda continued. Since you have the Platinum Plan, you can opt to restart the simulation under the parameters of your own choosing. Or you can end it and go back to your real life. Keep in mind that while choosing to go back to your real life only freezes your Platinum membership. Spots for the Platinum Virtual Reality are scarce right now, so you may be put on a waiting list until there is an availability. I remembered paying a ton of money for the simulation. It cost me an arm and a leg for that Platinum membership, which is essentially a lifetime plan for the simulation. Amanda smiled and said, You should go stretch your legs a little. You haven't been active in five years, and even though we kept your muscles from atrophying with our technology, staying in the simulation longer than six years without any movement is not recommended. I gave a confused nod, and allowed her to help me up. At first my legs were wobbly, but pretty soon I was able to move in a stable manner without any help. I approached the door. It slid open and revealed a long, pristine corridor in front of me. I spent five minutes to go to the bathroom and drink some water, admiring the technology around me which I had completely forgotten about. In the simulation, there were no intelligent robots performing duties like cleaning the building, attending to new guests, etc. Each of the robots looked convincingly human and even behaved so, with the only thing giving them away being the same kind of green dot on their wrist as Amanda. I got some water from the water tank and sipped as I stared out the window. The entire city's view was in front of me. Tall skyscrapers rose to insurmountable heights and automated cars roamed the streets. But they were not quite what I expected. The buildings looked dilapidated and old, while the streets below were littered with a plethora of garbage. I saw homeless people begging on the streets, and military armed with heavy guns patrolling and chasing those beggars away. And then I started to remember the fragments of the old world I used to live in. I had almost forgotten completely about the ravaging of the world. Global warming, exhaustion of the natural reserves, extinction of animals and insects, which caused a chain reaction. Soon, the food supplies, oil, and other important resources got low and the people started to panic. There were widespread protests all over the world. They couldn't do much, however. Privacy is pretty much non-existent with all the microchips we have installed in our heads, and the facial recognition cameras mounted on the streets. Not to mention the social points, which was a means of mass control. You obey the government without questions, you get social points. You turn in your family members if you suspect they are a criminal, you get a lot of social points. But if you do something bad, your privileges are taken away. You can't get a good job or college degree, you can't leave the country and you're closely monitored by the loyalty observations units until you either do something wrong or are deemed loyal enough to go back to a normal life. So with all that, the government had no problem quelling the protests and intimidating the rest of us into submission. The building I was in was one grand illusion, which masked the harsh reality of the outside dystopian world. I contemplated my old life, and my memory started flooding back, overwhelming me with bad emotions. I remembered my old family. I used to have a wife and two children. But when my wife complained about the government to the wrong person, who she thought was a friend, she was arrested, and our children were taken away by the child protection services. I never saw them again. My children are probably right now being brainwashed by the program to be obedient and give up their lives for their country, and I didn't even know if my wife was still alive. I'm almost certain that when she was sent to a labor camp, she didn't survive. No one survives it. After they were taken away, I grew more desperate and started drinking, until I learned about Veltech Industries. With the company, I could have my old life back. But was it really worth it? To live in a world which wasn't real, while my body rotted away in a machine, just to have the illusion of happiness? The view outside my window was my answer. I staggered back to the simulation room, where Amanda greeted me with a friendly smile. She asked me, So, have you made your decision, sir? I nodded. Take me back, I said.
Our sixth story in this collaboration is Amelia by Nerdcore Creep. As read by Nerdcore Creep, Creepypasta Adam, and Musy's Modern Dreadfuls. Linda and Marcus watch their beautiful daughter Amelia as she gently brushes the hair of her favorite doll, Jane. As they hold each other's hands, they smile at the sight of such innocence, of such happiness. The two young parents would do anything to protect their little girl, even if it meant giving up their lives for her. They loved her so much, and having her in their lives strengthened their love for each other. Marcus stares into Linda's eyes as she smiles brightly in response. They kiss, feeling each other's warm embrace. For ten seconds, they remind each other of the passion they have felt for the last ten years, a passion that has burned strong that entire time. For ten seconds, they take their eyes off of their beloved Amelia. As they slowly pull away from each other, Linda just so happens to look into the direction where Amelia is supposed to be. To her horror, the previously occupied nine-year-old child and her favorite doll were gone. Amelia? Linda exclaims in a panic. Amelia! Yells Marcus as well. Panic strikes at their hearts as they begin to frantically search. Soon, the decision to live a quiet, isolated life in the middle of the woods, away from the dangerous and unpredictable happenings of the nearby town, no longer seemed like a wise decision. It was unlike the young couple to take their eyes off of their child while outside the safety of their log-built house, even just for ten seconds. Ten seconds, which seemed so minuscule at the time, proved to be just long enough for their worst fears to become reality. Ten seconds became ten minutes of searching, which became ten days and eventually ten months. Ten months passed until Amelia's tenth birthday, and for ten months the couple that had once felt nothing but love and happiness were now reduced to empty shelves of their former selves. In ten months, no trace of Amelia was ever found. Nothing except for one thing, that is. During the initial search by the panicked couple, Marcus stumbled upon Jane, their now lost daughter's most cherished possession. Beyond the lone doll, however, it was as though the poor child simply vanished into thin air. There were no footprints, torn articles of clothing, or stains of blood anywhere in the vast forest, and they made certain to spend every minute they could combing the entirety of that forest. As Marcus drinks his fifth bottle and passing out yet again, Linda stares into the eyes of the doll. Tears cloud her vision. But ever since that day, it was as though she were looking into the eyes of Amelia herself. This feeling made the inexplicable loss that much more painful. Such a small part of her was not nearly enough. She wanted everything back. She wanted her baby. Wiping the tears from her eyes, she looks over to the poor excuse of the man she once loved. Utter disgust in her house. She blamed him, of course. But with that, she also had to blame herself. They both took their eyes away from her, and so they were both responsible for losing her. Those ten seconds of love for each other would prove to be the last. The sight of each other now disgusted the couple that once held each other in such high regard. It was as though Amelia had been the glue that held them together, and with her gone, their love was doomed to fall apart. One night, however, there would be yet another change in the direction of their lives. There was a knock at their door. As always, there was just as much hope of it being their recovered daughter as the dread of it being a police officer delivering tragic news. Cautiously optimistic, Linda opens the door to see a strange man. His face was covered by a long grey beard, and his eyes were a strange, sickly yellow. Hello, ma'am. He begins, a tired old voice escaping his lips. My name is Nicholas Rasguño, and I have come to offer you a gift. As Linda, not amused by the sudden appearance of a stranger, gives him the once-over and bitterly remarks, Oh, yeah? Is it my daughter? To this remark, the old man gives Linda a rotten tooth-filled grin and answers back, Well, actually, Signora, that's exactly what it is. <gasps> what? She gasps, her eyes growing large at hearing those words. May I come in, por favor? Asks Nicholas, maintaining his smile. Why, yes, of course! Linda exclaims, 
allowing the old man to enter. At this point, the only thing that concerned the hopeful young mother was that this strange old man might actually be a lead to finding their daughter. She didn't understand what he meant by his gift being her daughter, but she was determined to find out by any means necessary. Please, have a seat. Linda offers Nicholas as she kicks her passed out husband who was lying drunk on the couch. Thank you, Linda. Answers Nicholas, accepting the offer. The hell is this? Asks Marcus, slurring his words from inebriation. This? Linda begins to answer, the tone in her voice communicating her annoyance with her husband. Is Mr. Rasguno. He may have some information about where we can find Emilia. Almost immediately, these words seem to all but sober Marcus right up. His eyes grow large and he stands to his feet, staring directly at the still smiling Nicholas and demands, Well? Speak! I'm afraid you misinterpret, answers the old man. I don't have information for you. I can give her back to you. Right here and now. Suddenly, rage explodes inside Marcus, who rushes over and grabs Nicholas by the collar of his coat. Tell me now, he yells. What did you do with her, you son of a bitch? As much as Linda wants to join her husband in beating the information out of the stranger, she understands that Amelia is clearly not with him at the moment, and if they want any chance at seeing her again, they need to not lose their heads. Knock it off, you idiot! She yells at Marcus, pulling him away from the ever-smiling Nicholas. He knows where she is! Her agitated husband exclaims. Yeah, no shit. Do you think he's going to tell us where if you act like a moron? Again, senora. Nicholas interrupts. I'm not going to give you any information about where your beautiful little girl is. I'm going to present her to you. Linda and Marcus look at each other in confusion, and then back to Nicholas. I... I don't understand, says Linda. I will present to you your child. But before I do so, there are a couple of things I'm going to need. A look of disgust shows on Linda's face as she says, How much? Nicholas then begins to laugh, the sound of an old dying hyena. No, 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 no. I don't need money. All I need from you is the child's most cherished possession, and for you to sign this release. This is completely fucking ridiculous. Linda thought to herself. How could anyone require grieving parents to sign a waiver to see their missing child? And on top of that, hand over her most cherished possession as some sick form of payment. She maintains her composure, however, and walks over to the table on which Jane, their daughter's most cherished possession, sat. She picks up the doll and hands it over. The old man strokes the hair of the doll, and Marcus tries his best to contain his rage at the thought of this old man doing this with his little girl. And now, the release. Nicholas reminds them, handing Linda a piece of paper. She reads over the small amount of writing, which simply reads, In exchange for the soul of our daughter, Emilia, we, in sound body and mind, sign over that our own immortal souls to one Nicholas Resguño. Linda, losing her composure, scoffs at what she has just read. Ah! What the hell is this? Exactly what it says, answers Nicholas. In exchange for your immortal souls, I will return the soul of your dearest Emilia. Who the hell with this? Shouts Marcus, fists bald as he approaches Nicholas. Stop, says Linda, not taking her eyes off the vile old man. Just sign the goddamn papers, and if we don't see our little girl, we kill this son of a bitch. Nicholas chuckles at that remark as Linda signs her name to the paper. Reluctantly, Marcus signs it as well and shoves it into the old man's chest. Excellent, says Nicholas as he rises from his seat. He then takes the doll and places its mouth to his, giving it a long and uncomfortable kiss. He then hands it back to Linda, who accepts it, feeling utterly confused. Thank you for doing business, he says, turning to leave the house. Quickly, Marcus blocks the door before he can do so. Hold the hell on! The furious father yells. Where the hell is she, old man? What do you mean? Answers Nicholas, still smiling. She's right there. 
He points at the doll as Linda stares down at the tiny body in her hands. Confusion quickly turns to anger as she throws the doll to the ground, grabs one of her husband's empty bottles and smashes it over Nicholas's head. He yells in pain as blood and broken glass flies away from his wounded head and he falls to the floor, that wicked smile finally leaving his face. Marcus then proceeds to kick and beat the old man viciously as Linda walks to her bedroom and promptly returns holding a 9mm pistol. Where the hell is she, you old fuck? She screams in his face, pistol whipping him repeatedly. With blood gushing from his nose, eyes, and mouth, slowly but surely, Nicholas's same smile forms. He then begins to laugh uncontrollably. Her patience gone, and under the impression that Nicholas was a crazy old bastard that just wanted to make her pain worse, she fires a single shot between his life, abruptly ending his laughter. For ten seconds there is silence, until suddenly, there is a voice. A small, faint, and familiar voice coming from behind Linda. Mom? Me? Says the small, yet unmistakable voice of Amelia. Trembling, Linda turns around to see the small, broken body of Amelia's doll, Jane. It's moving around, and it's now partially shattered head trying to pick itself up, but ultimately falling back down. Tears fall from Linda's eyes as she witnesses the small porcelain doll which she had carelessly thrown to the floor struggle to move. Marcus, frozen with shock and confusion, can only mutter out, Amelia! in a strained, choked voice. Why? Mom? Me? says the voice of Amelia. Linda rushes over to the tiny body, completely at a loss for words, and picks her up, pieces of her shattered head falling to the floor. A single eye looks at the distraught mother, and one final time, utters the word, before there is silence once again, the doll stops moving completely. For the briefest moment and most unexpected of ways, Linda and Marcus had gotten their beloved daughter back, but before they could even realize what was happening, she was gone once again, and for good. Linda screams and Marcus falls to his knees and weeps. Once again, carelessness has cost them their daughter, and Linda can't take it anymore. Her heart shattered and her soul apparently gone, she glares at Marcus, who stares at her, hatred burning in his eyes. He doesn't have time to do anything about it, however, as she aims the gun at him and fires three times, hitting him in the chest. She doesn't bother to make sure he's actually dead before she turns the gun on herself and fires a single round into her temple. All is quiet in the house of the dead. There is a dead silence, until the sounds of laughter echoes throughout. Nicholas Rescuño picks himself up and pulls the single bullet from between his eyes and flicks it away like a dead bug. Smiling wider than ever, he picks up the lifeless head of Marcus and claims his rightful property that is the man's soul, as he places the cold, dead lips to his own. He then walks over to Linda and does the same. Only by Linda and Marcus offering their souls free in exchange for the soul of Amelia, who, being a child he had easily conned out of giving up her own ten months prior, was he able to claim them. Giving up the soul of a single child was more than a deal to exchange for two adult souls rich with pain and sin. As Nicholas takes his newly acquired property, he leaves the poor lonely soul of Amelia now doomed to walk in limbo, with no longer a human body as it is remained perfectly hidden and rotting away, and not even a vessel such as her most cherished doll to inhabit any longer. As far as the rest of the world would know, the grieving mother, distraught from the disappearance and presumed death of her child, resorted to murdering her husband and taking her own life. No one would ever know of Nicholas Resguño, except, of course, for the next unlucky soul that would cross his path. So did you miss me? Well, the good news is I'm back with another one now, and I am joined by the wonderful Mr. Extremes. For a story entitled, I've been trapped alone in a fallout bunker for months until now, by C. Rai. I've been locked alone in here for over a year. Until today, that is. I'm not locked in here against my will. Oh no, I lock myself in here. But where is here exactly? Here is a bunker 
that I had constructed over the past 10 years. I started it back in 52 and finished it just before those damn commies put those missiles in Cuba. After that happened, I knew I had to save myself before something terrible happened. So I grabbed all that I could and locked myself underground. I know that they launched those missiles, because I haven't heard any sort of movement outside of here in months. Ever since then, I've been in here, waiting and waiting, until it's safe to return to the surface. My bunker sits 100 feet underground, only one way out, through a hatch in the top and through a long tunnel with only a ladder inside. And I've been alone this entire time. Until now. Just last night, someone came knocking on the hatch. I ignored it at first. Thought I was hearing things because well, it's so far away. But they haven't let up now for three days. Every morning he comes back and starts back up again. I've been listening to that wretched banging for three whole days. I wasn't going to open it because I knew that well, if I let someone else in, I wouldn't have enough supplies to go around for more than one, but I felt bad that someone might actually be alive out there and needs my help. But I can't stand that noise anymore. Oh, it's been relentless. He must have been yelling too, because sometimes it'll stop for ten seconds or so, and then start all over again. Finally, when I couldn't last any longer, and I felt like my head was going to explode, I cracked. I made the ascent up to the hatch and listened closely. The man was yelling to let him in, in between the banging. I couldn't help but feel pity for the man. And some caution, because... He might just have been out to take the things that I'd worked so hard to achieve. Then I thought about how lonely I've been, how long I've gone without human contact, and, well, I couldn't resist it any longer. I gave in to temptation and yelled back at the man. I yelled to the man that I was going to open the hatch and to move back. I turned the wheel and threw the heavy door open to see a man standing in the dirt next to the opening, his fist bloodied and broken from the constant banging. He wasn't a very physically imposing man, but not a small man to be sure. I eyed him with suspicion, but he looked so relieved that I'd opened the door that I couldn't help but feel like I'd done something good. Hmm. How do you survive out here so long? I inquired, still eyeing the man, my body half in the ground, half out. What do you mean? There's no danger out here. He responded, a little confused. What do you mean? Those missiles in Cuba are still there. War hasn't broken out yet? I asked, confused. Because if the bombs hadn't been dropped, why had the noise of traffic stopped months ago? Why had the radio signals been dead? Why was it always so quiet? Oh no, there is a war. But it doesn't involve the bombs. The Northeast has been evacuated, and I came back to look for some things I left out here. He said, gesturing towards a group of cabins nearby. Hmm, I'm assuming you didn't find what you were looking for, I said, looking at his empty hand. No. Nobody was there. I was headed back when I found the plans to your little shelter in the basement of one of the cabins, and I came only to find it locked. Why do you want to get in? If there's no bombs, then what's the point of coming down here? I asked, leaning closer. Can we talk about this inside? I don't think it's safe out here. Okay. I'll get down first so I can keep an eye on you, I said. Turn the wheel to close the hatch when you enter. The man entered 
and I descended the rungs of the ladder until I reached the very bottom, keeping my eyes on him the whole time. I opened the door when I reached the bottom and stepped into my shelter. The stranger was right behind me, and he closed the door as he walked in and then sat down on one of the chairs in the kitchen. I sat across from him, and we both sat in silence for a moment. Then I asked him once again, So, what's about to happen? I asked, looking at the stranger. You really don't know. The Soviets are invading. And if they lose the invasion, then the bombs are going off, no doubt. They're invading? I repeated, shocked. That's what the government says anyway. And they've evacuated the entire south and northwest. They haven't got here yet. I asked inquisitively. I don't think they're really invading. I haven't heard so much as a peep since coming out here. Not even our own military out here. I think they called the invasion off, or we beat them and our government hasn't told us yet. They're always lying. And why would the Soviets invade if they have rockets? They would lose too many men to an invasion. It's not worth it to them. But better safe than sorry, am I right? He said with a wide grin on his face. I knew I needed to get in soon, and who would have known it's been occupied? Do you have any communication with the outside world down here? Radio's been silent for months. I don't even have it on anymore, I said, still letting the stranger's story sink in. Well, there's not much here, so I don't need to give you the grand tour. Now that we're splitting rations... I only have food for a few more months at the most. After that, well, we'll deal with that when it comes along, I explained to the man, both of us still sitting in the kitchen chairs. We don't need to wait that long. We don't need to wait that long. We can leave here sooner once we know for sure that there's no invasion, the man said, matter-of-factly. We both continued sitting there, the man letting the new atmosphere of the place sink in. In my mind, I was glad that someone else was here with me, but I couldn't help but feel slightly suspicious of the newcomer. I hadn't spoken to another soul in months, so I just shrugged it off as anxiety from a change in my routine. We continued with the routine of living underground for the next couple months. We rarely talked, just sat around doing pointless tasks to pass the time. But every time we did talk, he always brought up the possibility that it was a false alarm and that the surface was clear. But I wasn't about to risk everything I'd worked for to be destroyed by a chance that it was safe. When he wasn't talking about the surface being safe, he'd be talking about all of the government's lies and how they'd been manipulative. <sighs> It was really starting to get to me. And he ate more food than I did. But I never complained. I just acted like I didn't notice. But my resentment for him slowly grew. If he kept this up, we'd be out of supplies in a matter of weeks. Now I avoided talking to him because he would always return to the topic of the surface. Chances were... If we returned to the surface, we'd be met with a nuclear wasteland, or staring down the barrels of Soviet rifles. Every time he said we should return, I dismissed him. He brought it up again later, and again, and again. Finally, I snapped, and we got into an argument about the whole thing. The solitude was starting to get to me, and I let it all out on him. I'd been alone with that man for four months now. Now, we just go about our routine. Some days, speaking nothing at all. And the silence. The silence. It's the kind of silence that you can hear. It sounds like nothing, yet it makes the loudest noise. I can't take it anymore. I need a change. I'll be damned if he ruins everything for me. Nothing ever changes down here, even our daily conversation. He 
still brings out the topic of returning to the surface. I feel like he's trying to get rid of me. Trying to steal everything that I've got for himself. That's why he's talking about the surface so much. That's why he's always going on about it. He's out to get me, because he wants it all to himself. And the other day, we really got into it. We were in the living room, and he tried to bring it up again, and I responded with a smart retort. If you believe all the shit you say, then why the hell are you still here? I asked him in an aggressive tone. Because I don't want to go out there alone. Why don't you come with me? He asked. The hell I am. There's no telling what could be up there. I sure don't want to be up there with you, I yelled in response. What the hell is that supposed to mean? If that's the case, why are you down here with me? He asked, standing up and stepping towards me. What? You're the one who's down here with me. This is my place, and all you've done is take advantage of my hospitality. You won't shut the fuck up about all the lies and cover-ups done by the government. You actually believe that bullshit. You're going to get us both killed if you keep trying to leave. Oh, and you're some gracious host, then? If you didn't want me down here, then why would you let me in in the first place? We're going to have to leave sometime, and you know it. When that day comes, you won't turn my offer down. He said as he stormed out of the living room and into the bunk room. Now I know he's trying to lure me out. He hasn't even made an offer other than to come up with him. I don't know what that whack job has planned, but I'm not falling for his shit. I'm not going to let him leave and endanger both of us. I should never have let him in in the first place. I regret it every day. Every night, I don't sleep out of fear that he's going to try something. Now I see signs of him planning it everywhere. He sounds suspicious. Every time I see him, he looks suspicious. How I would love to get rid of this parasite and have my place all to myself once again. I can see it now. Things back to the way they used to be. The peace and quiet I once despised, I now long for more than anything. At this moment in time, there wasn't very much I wouldn't do to fulfill that desire. The next day, we ran out of food. He lost it again. We got into another argument and he stormed off, even angrier than the last time. Once again, my resentment grew to full-blown hate. Everything that was wrong, I found a way in my mind to pin it on him. Maybe it was being confined in this space for the better part of a year, or how little I communicate with the only other inhabitant, but, well, I started to get restless. He gives me weird looks now, and we haven't spoken since the argument. He's going to do it soon, because of the food problem. He's getting desperate. And so now, I wait for him to make his move. I will make him regret it. Oh, I can't wait for it to happen. Finally, an excuse to rid myself of this freeloader. The night following the day we ran out of supplies, I sat in bed thinking about this man's story. If the Soviets were invading then why didn't he just walk back to our lines and get back to civilization? It didn't add up. He was hiding something. A reason for why he didn't want to go back to the rest of the country. But he didn't want to stay underground. Every day my trust for the man wanes more and more. I started keeping a knife on me wherever I went. I was afraid that he'd try something so that he could leave. Whenever he was asleep... I would quietly sharpen the blade, telling myself how I can't wait to use it on the bastard. I could imagine plunging it into him and hearing the quiet once again. Oh, the piercing noise of silence. 
Every day, I fought the temptation to use it on him. Oh, how hard it was to resist the urge. But I knew the day would come. Soon, soon I can enjoy the silence again. The next night, he snuck out of bed and tried to make a break for it. I was ready for him, though. I knew this was going to happen tonight, so I stayed up and waited for him to try it. He left the room and made a break towards the door to the ladder. I jumped out of bed, grabbed the knife out of my pillowcase, and ran after him. He had to slow down to open the door, and even though the room was twenty feet across... I closed the distance between us in no time at all and tackled the man from behind. Get the hell off me, I'm getting out of here. He yelled, trying to throw me off of him. You don't know what you're doing. You're going to kill us both. I yelled as I pinned him down and stabbed the knife downwards in an arc towards his chest. He saw the blade and tried to roll to the side, and the blade caught him. The knife was lodged in between his ribs so I resorted to my fist and started throwing punches towards his face. One punch landed squarely on his nose, and I felt it crack beneath my hand. Hot blood squirted all over my fist and his face. He yelled, turned over, and kicked me off. He lunged for the ladder and tried to make his way up, yelling in pain from the knife lodged in his side. I climbed on the ladder as well and tried to grab his leg, but he kicked down and landed a hit squarely in my forehead. He kept going, and I kept following. He made it to the top. I was right below him. As he diverted his attention to the hatch, I reached up and grabbed his feet and pulled them from the rungs that were slippery from his blood. He let out a cry as he lost his balance and fell backwards down the shaft of the tunnel and plummeted towards the bottom. I heard him hit the sides on the way down and he landed with a sickening crunch at the bottom of the ladder. I climbed down, making sure not to slip on the man's blood, which now stained the walls of the space as well. I reached the bottom of the ladder and saw the man's lifeless body, bent and broken, laying in a heap at the bottom of the ladder. He was dead. Come to think of it, I never even knew his name. I had to do it, though. He would have killed me, but now that he was gone, the silence was back. Oh, the dreaded silence. So loud and so quiet all at once. I walked into the living room and reclined in a chair. And just listened. I swear. I heard the sound of cars. Not just cars, but the sound of people too. I must have been hallucinating. There was no way. I listened harder, straining myself to hear. And sure enough, there it was. The sound of people talking. I followed the sound back up the ladder, slippery with blood, all the way to the base of the hatch. The voices were louder now. It sounded like someone was yelling. I grabbed the hatch and turned it throwing open the heavy door once again. Outside, it was bright and sunny, and nearby the highway was littered with cars, and two people arguing over a flat tire on the side of the road. <laughs> he was right. He was an honest man who hadn't lied to me. <laughs> His theories were right and I'd killed him for it. And I'd enjoyed what I'd done, because now I once again live in relative peace and quiet.
Up next, a tale from Hyper Obscure. My next door neighbor from where I grew up had a bad case of resting witch face syndrome, as read by Nurk or Creep and Musy's Modern Dreadful. When you're young, I'm talking elementary to middle school young, old people are scary and gross. There might be some exceptions, like your grandparents or the sweet old lady next door who always offers you weird off-brand candy, but in general they are terrifying and disgusting. One reason you might feel this way is, of course, that you don't understand them, or they don't understand you. The other, more plausible reason is this. They are quite simply evil, nefarious, demonic beings. Next door from where I grew up, one of these so-called old people once lived. Her name was Mrs. Carmichael. Clara Carmichael. But most of the kids in the neighborhood, myself included, just called her old witch face. Just look at her. She's so a witch. That was Rodney talking. I should probably introduce him now. Rodney was a self-proclaimed king of mischief, a rebel with several causes. He was tall for his age, usually a head or two taller than the rest of us, depending on what shoes he wore. He was also extremely thin and gangly, a poster boy for pubertal awkwardness. She's just old, Rodney. Doesn't make her a witch. Q. Arnold Burrowicks. More often than not, the sober voice of reason in our little gang. If Rodney was tall for his age, Arnold was abnormally normal for his age. If you'd look up 12-year-old Caucasian boy in the dictionary, you'd probably find a picture of Arnold. Brown-haired, slightly freckled, shy, and probably gay. She's a witch. I saw her water her plants with blood. Probably eats blood babies too. That would be Lana. As far as I know, she was the only girl who'd ever want to be seen with us. That meant that we were all in love with her. Well, Rodney and me were at least. Not Arnold. I guess that's the reason we figured he was gay. Not that there's anything wrong with that. She was blonde and sweet and pretty, but also total badass. She could beat any one of us into a bloody pulp and had done so on multiple occasions. I don't know what she is, but she gives me the creeps. And lastly, possibly leastly, introducing myself, Peter. I guess I'd be the nerdy kid in the group. I loved astronomy, computers, and science, and would often annoy the heck out of everyone with my poignant but poorly timed, well, actually. Any of you kids have the hankering for some candy? Oh, I almost forgot Mrs. Patterson. She was the off-brand candy lady of our street. A sweet old woman who somehow always seemed to tolerate us, even after Rodney pulled his daily pranks on her. I'm talking firecrackers in the mailbox, the old dog turd in a flaming paper bag, ringing the doorbell and running away. Ageless classics. To be fair, Rodney pulled them all over the street. You don't become the king of mischief otherwise. But Mrs. Patterson was the only one that took it with a smile. Boys will be boys, she'd say with a chuckle. Right now, we were spying on old witch face, crouching behind her mailbox as we took turns with the binoculars. We couldn't really get a good look at her, but every once in a while, her head would pop up between her many houseplants. Her many sickly houseplants. Look, I'm no botanist, but those plants didn't look right. Hence the rumor that she watered them with blood. They were covered in weird wart-like growths and had a strange deep red complexion and had a generally bizarre appearance. We're good, Mrs. Patterson, I said, just spying on Mrs. Carmichael. Oh, you kids, she chuckled. Always up to something. Remember to eat your vegetables. She limped back to her porch and sat down in her rocking chair. She lived next door to Mrs. Carmichael, but I don't think they got along very well. Which I always found weird. They were the same age. Old people of the same age should be friends. That's like a rule or something. Oh, shit! There she is again! 
Lana whispered excitedly. That face freaks me out. I nodded vigorously. Mrs. Carmichael had a classic case of resting witch face, no doubt about it. Her wrinkles dropped in a way to form a perpetual frown, and her nose was long and crooked. She also had those eyes. You know, the ones that always seem to emit pure, unfiltered hatred? Yeah, those. We'd never see her outside. She was always cooped up in her house, probably eating babies, and we'd only see her briefly when she was tending to those bilious plants. Rodney would pull his pranks on her every once in a while, but she didn't care. Didn't even do anything. Or so we thought, at least. It happened a few days later. Rodney didn't show up for school for a couple of days, and suddenly the police came around asking questions. They interviewed all the pupils, asking if they'd seen Rodney, knew where he'd like to hang out, stuff like that. It freaked us out, rightly so. What the heck's going on? Arnold inquired nervously at lunch. Where's Rodney? I don't know, Lana said. What about you, Peter? He usually hangs around your place. I haven't seen him since... I had to think about it for a second. Since we spied on old witch face. You don't think that... Lana started. That she has something to do with it? No. Arnold said. Come on, guys. She isn't a witch. She's just an old woman. I don't know, Arnold. I said. Usually I'm on your side, but she did give Rodney that look. It was true. Right as we were getting bored spying at Mrs. Carmichael, Rodney decided to pull a prank. He threw a stone at the house, aiming for the roof, but instead it smashed through a window. We all saw her, her witch face popping into view, those hateful eyes staring right at poor Rodney, the king of mischief, frozen in fear as he realized he'd done fucked up. The cops obviously can't find him, Lana suggested. And we know what Witchface is capable of. What do you mean? Arnold asked. You know? Lana whispered. Munching on infants? So what are we going to do about it? I asked. What can we do about it? A rescue mission, Lana said. We're going to break into our house. The plan was as simple as it was stupid. Arnold, who initially didn't want any part of it, was going to be our decoy. His only mission was to keep her occupied at the front door while Lana and I went around the back. We knew there was an entrance down to the basement there, like a trap door or something. Rodney had spotted it on one of his prank tours, but he said it was locked. I figured my dad's crowbar could help us unlock it. Once in, all we had to do was locate Rodney and the odd baby and get him or them the hell out of there. You ready? I asked Arnold. Who wasn't? Yes. He lied. Let's do this then. Lana said. Let's free the king of mischief. Lana and I crouched down behind the mailbox as Arnold swallowed deeply and nervously walked up to Mrs. Carmichael's front door. He stood there for a few minutes, probably trying to find his courage before he gently started tapping on the door. I don't see her in the windows, Lana whispered. Come on, let's go. I nodded and followed her as she snuck around the corner. We could hear Arnold tapping still, but when we rounded the second corner, we were too far away. We just had to trust that he got the job done. We quickly found the door leading to the basement, and I feverishly rummaged around in my backpack for the crowbar. Hurry, Lana said. We gotta do this fast. I handed her the crowbar. She was definitely the strongest and most capable of the bunch, so I figured she better handle all the heavy lifting. She gave the lock a powerful yank, and with a rather loud crunch, the thing cracked in two. Shitty lock. She smiled as she nonchalantly opened the door. The basement was dark, rank, and damp. Lana switched on her flashlight and silently snuck around illuminating every inch of the place as she made her way to the door on the other side of the room. We couldn't see anything suspicious, just ruined cardboard boxes, empty jars, and shelves stacked with old newspapers. No Rodney, 
no babies. Come on! Lana whispered as she silently opened the door to the next room. It led to a narrow, cramped hallway. At the end of it, we could see the stairs leading up. Lana motioned for me to follow her as she stealthily started ascending the steps. I shook my head vigorously. It was too dangerous. We didn't plan this part. We were just going to search the basement. Witches always kept babies and Rodneys in the basement. Come on! Lana mouthed silently and gesticulated wildly in my direction. I sighed deeply. I knew I couldn't turn back now. Lana would beat the crap out of me. She waited for me about halfway up the stairs and I dutifully followed as she started ascending them again. I don't know when we first started noticing the smell, but at some point we had to stop and cover our noses. Lana looked at me with true fear in her eyes. It scared the hell out of me. I hadn't smelled anything quite like it before. It was a rotten and pungent stench, really burrowing its foul odor into our nasal cavities. I think we both realized what it was, though. The repugnant smell of death and decay. We should turn around, I whispered. We should call the police. Lana shook her head. No way, she whispered. We gotta find Rodney first. At the top of the stairs, there was nothing but a closed door. Lana motioned for me to stop and stay silent. I did. I could hear it clear as day. The gentle tapping of Arnold's fist on the front door. He still hadn't gotten her to open. She had to be somewhere on the first floor. We gotta go, I murmured pathetically. She's still in there. Lana just stared at me intently as she slowly opened the door. We don't leave anyone behind, she whispered. The repulsive wave of humid decay and that repulsive stench of decomposition that hit us as that door swung open will forever be imprinted in my nostrils. We both had to heave for breath, almost instantly <coughs> retching our guts out as the smell overcame us. I don't know how Lana could continue after that, but she did. I was left crawling behind her on the floor tears streaming down my face, but I saw it too, the sight that changed Lana forever. First of all, the living room was entirely covered in blood. I mean entirely. Every surface dripping, stained, not a single spot left untouched. The second thing I saw was Mrs. Carmichael, or her head I should say. It was propped up on a broomstick, stuck real good on there, and the broom was bobbing back and forth in the bucket it was erected in. Her eyes were open, an empty dead gaze staring into the void. But the thing that I'm pretty sure sent Lana's mind spinning into the intangible realms of madness was the plants. They weren't plants. They were body parts. Hands, arms, legs, toes, guts, heart, liver, lungs, you name it. Gently placed in pots, drenched in unnameable fluids, covered in maggots and flies. I heard Lana scream my name once. She hasn't spoken since. I got the hell out of there and promptly called the police. Well, my parents did. I was in no shape to do anything, to be honest. They spent weeks combing through every inch of that house, but they could never find any trace of Rodney. It was just Mrs. Carmichael. All that blood. All those body parts. They all belonged to her. Poor old witch face. Anyway, we moved a month or so later. Everybody in the neighborhood did. No one wanted to stick around after that. Not even Mrs. Patterson, who'd lived there her entire life. The police could never figure out what happened to Mrs. Carmichael. They guessed it had something to do with Rodney's disappearance, though. A serial killer, maybe. Some sicko, at the very least. I say never, but... I say never, but that's not really true. 
It took them ten years, and it was all a coincidence. Some contractor bought up all the properties in the neighborhood, was going to turn them into parking lots or something, but they had a little snag when the digging crew came over a corpse. The corpse of a young boy. The corpse of Rodney, buried in the garden. In sweet old off-brand candy Mrs. Patterson's garden. I guess the old saying holds some truth. You should never judge a witch by her face. Our penultimate tale this evening is Safe and Sound by A Clock Strikes Three. As read by A Clock Strikes Three, Scarecrow Tales and Madame Frightman. I work in a nursing home as an admissions coordinator. I give tours and help residents move into the facility when they're no longer safe at home. I tell their families they'll be safe and sound here at Covington Hills, loved and cared for. Up until now, I would have said that was true, but my residents were dying and not from natural causes. Of that, I am sure. Death is a huge part of working in a nursing home. We're surrounded by death. Sometimes, in the case of our terminally ill residents, it's even welcomed. But recently, something strange had been happening. Perfectly healthy residents were dying, and they all had one thing in common. Frequent hallucinations of a woman in their room in the weeks leading up to their deaths. Now, hallucinations in elderly people is not uncommon. Many residents with dementia or even a UTI can have hallucinations, which is why none of us were all that surprised when residents started talking to a lady only they could see. Just a natural progression of their dementia, the nurses would say, and we would all give that same sad nod. Dementia is a hell of an illness. I'm not a nurse, nor am I an expert in dementia, but I did find it strange that all the residents were hallucinating a woman. Usually hallucinations will vary. Some residents may see their long-dead spouse, or some might see bugs or birds. Many of them see children. But in the past two months, we had three residents with hallucinations, and they each saw a woman, and only a woman. Another strange thing I noticed was that only one resident at a time had hallucinations. It's not unheard of, but the pattern the hallucinations followed was the exact same, and that, coupled with the fact that the residents all seemed to see the same thing, struck me as odd. The hallucinations all started off pleasant enough, with the affected resident happily chatting to the unseen woman but soon they turned frightening. The cries of, get her out of my room, get her out, would echo throughout the hallways, and within days, they would pass away. There was chatter in the hallways and the staff break room about how strange it was, but still, dementia can progress quickly, and though they seemed healthy, the residents in question were all in their 90s, and their bodies just gave out. At least, that's what we all told ourselves. After all, this was a nursing home. Death worked here just as much as any of us. It wasn't until last week that I really began to question if something else was going on. We say we don't pick favorites here, but everyone has at least one resident that they just click with. For me, I clicked with a man named John, who was 91 and sharp as a tack with a grumpy yet endearing personality. He moved in three months ago when it was clear his daughter could no longer care for him at home. He has Parkinson's, and while he was still able to walk, he wasn't as steady on his feet as he used to be, and he had fallen a few too many times in the past year for home to continue to be an option. The minute I was done touring him and his daughter through the facility, I knew he'd be a favorite of mine. He stood in the middle of our activities room, and let out a deep huff of a breath before turning to me and saying, Well, the place doesn't look like a complete hellhole, which is more than I can say about some of the places my daughter dragged me to. And if the other girls here have as pretty as you, I guess I'll be okay. Sign me up, doll. 
quick before I change my mind. What can I say? I'm a sucker for a charmer. John moved in the next week, and I helped his daughter set up his room. He was lucky enough to be able to afford a private room, and by the time we were done with it, it looked quite cozy. Listen, doll. He said when we were all done. I'm not going to call you by any other name than that, frankly. I can't be asking for real one. That can be a problem for you. His daughter looked absolutely mortified, but I just laughed. No, sir. Not a problem at all. And from that day on, I was doll, while everyone else, regardless of their job title, was nurse. Despite his dislike of remembering names, John's memory was excellent. He could tell you what he ate for breakfast last Wednesday without skipping a beat. He was as with it as any of us working at Covington Hills. So when he started complaining about a woman coming into his room, I figured another resident must have accidentally wandered in. It happens sometimes, and because the nursing home has a mix between residents with dementia and residents without, like John, I often had to do damage control after a wandering incident. Hey John, how you feeling today? Like hell, though. Like hell. Couldn't sleep a wink last night with that lady coming in here. Was it another resident? Sometimes people get confused, especially at night, and go into other people's rooms. They don't mean to intrude. No, she was younger than any of those old foggies living here. She said it was time for my medication, but I know damn well I don't take any medication at three in the goddamn morning. I told him I would look into it for him and ask the nurses to change the time of whatever medication they'd been trying to give him. But when I asked Sandy, the nurse manager, about it, she had no idea what I was talking about. John wasn't scheduled for any medications during the night, so no one should have woken him up to take something. She assured me she'd address it with the night staff to make sure it didn't happen again. I went back to John's room to let him know we'd figured it all out and that no one should bother him that night. When I came into work the next morning, I saw I had a voicemail on my office phone. I absentmindedly punched in my code and put the phone on speaker while I booted up my computer. Hey, you know, it's your favorite old pan that you know what. Yeah, to uh, let you know I'm not happy with you. I thought you said no one would wake me up last night. That damn nurse was in here again trying to give me medication. I told her where she could put it and she left her to that, but ruined my sleep. Uh, okay, they're here with my old medicine now. Yeah. Yeah. One minute, I gotta hang this damn thing up. I sighed and sucked in a deep breath to calm the frustration building up inside me. I knew the nurses were overwhelmed, but to make a med error two nights in a row was unacceptable. Luckily, John knew when his medication was due, but most of the other residents would just take whatever the nurse gave them, thinking it was correct. It was dangerous, and I would have to report it to the nurse manager yet again. I walked to Sandy's office and filled her in on John's less-than-happy voicemail. I called Jan, the nurse that was on the first night it happened, and she swears up and down that she didn't go into John's room that night. I even checked the cameras, and she was telling the truth. She was on last night, too. Then who did he see? Probably no one. Maybe it was a dream, or maybe it was a hallucination. His Parkinson's could be progressing. I'm sorry, Taryn. I know you two were close. Maybe he's just having bad dreams, and it will all be fine tonight. But I gotta go to a meeting. See you later, hun. Chin up. She gave my shoulder a squeeze before bustling down the hall, clipboard in hand. I went back to my office. I couldn't face seeing John just yet. I didn't know how to tell him that no one had been in his room those nights. I could tell him it was just dreams. But he would know, just like Sandy did, that it was likely Parkinson's dementia creeping in to take over his mind. Lunch came and went, and I finally decided I couldn't put off talking to John any longer. Hey, doll. Hey, John. I sat down on the edge of his bed and faced the recliner he was sitting in. Sandy checked the cameras last night and the night before, and no one went into your room. Maybe you're just having some weird dream. He cut me off before I could finish. They all think I have dementia and I'm hallucinating. He said with a scowl. 
You know these walls are a paper thin doll. I can hear these nurses talking in the hallway all day. I know what they say about me, but it's not true. This lady ain't a hallucination. I don't know what she's exactly, but she ain't good. I can tell you that. There was something about her face last night that was wrong. She looked normal enough the first night, but I was half asleep. But I thought she was just one of those new nurses you people always get here. But last night, doll, last night was different. Her eyes were golden red and she had too many teeth in her mouth. Too many sharp teeth. I know that sounds crazy, but you and I know what I'm saying. I picked up his hand and gave it a squeeze. He squeezed back and leaned forward, lowering his voice to a raspy whisper. I know something else too, doll. I know other people here have seen the same woman. I've heard him screaming at her to get out. I know that once they see her, they're goners. She does something to him, to us. Guess I'm a goner now, too. No, absolutely not, John. You're no more a goner than I am. Maybe all that eavesdropping you've been doing is giving you nightmares, I said with more confidence than I actually felt. As I left work that night, something kept nagging me. John was right. He was sane. A little forgetful at times, but he was still cognitively intact. There had to be something going on at Covington Hills. Ghosts and the paranormal were something staff would often whisper about to each other. So-and-so saw the ghost of a long-dead resident walking down the hall last night. The man in room 108 saw an angel and passed away the next day. And so on and so on. I believed the stories. You work in a place like this long enough and you just know that spirits exist. If something evil was hurting the residents of Covington Hills, it was my duty to stop it. The next evening, as I was about to leave work, I received a frantic phone call from Sandy. I'd never heard her so worked up before, but I soon understood why. It's John. He's threatening to hurt himself, Sandy said frantically. The senior psych ward is full at the hospital. We already called, and they said they wouldn't be able to admit him. We don't have enough nurses' aides on right now to have someone stay one-on-one -on -one with him, and he says he'll only have you stay with him. I know you've been working all day, but... I cut her off. Of course I'll stay with him. All night if I have to. It's okay. I haven't been sleeping much anyway. I'll be right over. When I got to John's room, he was sitting in his recliner, tapping his fingers anxiously against the chair's arm. John, what in the world is going on? I said, rushing over to him. Are you okay? Why would you want to hurt yourself? Hush, doll. I'm fine. I just said all the nonsense so you, you and I could be alone tonight. I have a plan to fight this thing that's been coming to my room all night. I sighed and sat down on his bed. You shouldn't have done that, John. Uh, I know, but I didn't get to 91 without taking some risks. Now listen, because I think I know how to make sure this nasty thing doesn't get any of us Alzheimer's anymore. He leaned back and let out a sigh before continuing. <sighs> I fought in the Korean War and I saw a lot of terrible things, doll. Men. Most of them really just boys, killing each other. Men I thought of as brothers dying from drinking contaminated water because it was all we could get. Innocent women and children died in the streets in front of us as we fought on. It was hell, doll. It was like being in hell. But there was something else there, too. Something evil that was basking in the hell we had created. At night, the guys would talk about spirits that wandered the streets looking for the souls to take. They looked like civilians at a glance, but... They would always be helping the people laying injured in the streets. The guys thought nothing of it and let them tend to their wounded. Sometimes they'd even try to help. But when they got closer to the helpers, they noticed their eyes glowed with a hint of red and mouths would open just a bit too wide when they talked. The wounded they were helping would 
die and the helpers would just disappear. The guys all said they never saw them leave. They would blink and the helpers would just be gone. Some of the guys asked around and found out that these things disguised as civilians were evil spirits that fed off the sick and dying. The war attracted them and they wandered the streets searching for the wounded. The only way to get rid of them was to offer up your own blood freely as a sacrifice. I never saw these things, but that nurse, she's got the same glow in her eyes that all the guys talked about. Same mouth, too. He pulled a knife out from his recliner's side pocket and set it on his bedside table. Sold us from lunch. <laughs> it should do. Okay, so I'll be the one doing the blood sacrifice, obviously. I don't need to give a lot of blood, do I? I asked with less confidence in my voice than I'd hoped for. He started to protest, but I held up my hand. You're 91, and I'm 31. I think I've got the best chance of healing up, okay? Besides, I'm supposed to be making sure you don't hurt yourself, remember? He relented, and we settled in for the night with some game shows and crime dramas after I assured the nursing staff that we were okay, and I'd let them know if I needed any help. At some point, I fell asleep, only to be woken up by the sound of John swearing. I rubbed my eyes and tried to focus on the scene in front of me. John was in his recliner, frantically reaching for the knife on the bedside table as a woman dressed in white scrubs stood over him, hands around his neck. Stop! I shrieked as I leapt from the bed and collided with the woman, knocking her away from John. She turned to face me, her eyes glowing a deep red that made my hair stand on end. Leave him alone, I said, as I reached behind me for the knife. The woman let out a shrill laugh, bearing rows and rows of sharp teeth. She raised an arm over her head before bringing it down in a swinging arc. She pointed at me, and the bedside table suddenly tipped over, crashing down onto my thighs. Although it was a small, lightweight table, it somehow pinned me to the floor. I struggled to lift it but it wouldn't move. She did something to it, John. I can't move it. I decided that I'd just have to make the blood sacrifice from the floor. The woman looked exactly like the things John had described from the war, and as much as I'd hoped it wouldn't come to shedding blood, it was the only thing we had to go off of. I looked around and saw the knife lying by John's feet, just out of my reach. John, I need the knife. The woman raised her arm again and pointed at me before clenching her fist. I felt my throat tighten. I tried to yell, but no sound came out. I was trapped, and I couldn't even scream for help. No worry, I'll, I'll do it. I tried to scream at John to stop as he bent over to pick up the knife. I frantically pushed at the table, but it was useless. I watched as the woman took a step toward John her mouth stretched into a terrible smile. He didn't flinch as she approached. He stood up from his chair and looked straight into her glowing eyes. I'll give you what you want. Blood. Given of my own accord. But then you will leave us alone. And you won't take any more souls here. The woman nodded and licked her lips. It was sickening, but I couldn't do anything to stop what was about to happen. John held his left arm out straight in front of him and brought the knife down on his flesh with a quick slice. As soon as the blood poured from the wound, the woman leapt at him. Her mouth latched onto his arm and she loudly began to drink the blood. I forced myself not to retch. I watched helpless as John winced in pain, the color beginning to drain from his face. After what seemed like a lifetime, the woman stopped. She straightened up and turned toward me, blood dripping from her mouth as she smiled at me once more. I blinked, and she was gone. I pushed the table off my legs with ease and rushed over to John, who had fallen to the floor. We, we did it, doll, he said before passing out. John was rushed to the hospital, where he made a full recovery, the official story was that I had passed out from not eating. I had, after all, skipped dinner to stay with John. 
John had attempted to rush to my side, but had knocked over the bedside table in the process. He tripped over the fallen table and cut himself on the knife when he landed. He insisted that he never wanted to hurt himself and didn't know why he'd said it. The hospital chalked it up to altered mental status from severe dehydration and cleared him to return to Covington Hills. To be safe, staff now cut his food for him and remove any knives from the room after they drop off his meals. So far, staff haven't reported any residents with hallucinations. For now, I think we're back to being safe and sound. And we round off today's Festival of Collaboration with the disappearance of the Brigantine children by N.M. Brown, as read by N.M. Brown and your horror show. When all of the children in our town disappeared, everyone was heartbroken. When all of the children in our town reappeared, everyone was terrified. December 25th, 2018 was the worst day our town had seen since its founding. People call it the Christmas of the Lost. My heart yearns to shatter just writing about it. Hundreds of parents laid out gifts under their Christmas trees the night before. Each parent woke up to an identical scene as when they went to sleep. Cookies and milk were untouched. Stockings bulged with undisturbed treats. And gifts rested in their places under the Christmas trees. Cold from the lack of children's joy. My wife Nina and I were no exception. I remember us tiptoeing past our son's bedroom as we carried his gifts from Santa down the hall. Nina was tipsy on eggnog, and I had a bit of holiday buzz going myself. We giggled and shushed each other as we stumbled through the house. It's one of my best memories, because it's the last time we ever laughed together. Hell, I can't even remember if we laughed at all since then. Ronnie was sleeping in his bed as he always was. I know this because my wife and I bickered about her going in there to give him a goodnight kiss. Looking back now, I thank God that she won that battle. Brings me something close to a hint of solace to know that some of his last moments in this house were spent under his mother's love. We set up his tricycle, placing the largest yellow bow atop the handlebars that we could find. Nina's mother's tradition dictated that we place an orange at the bottom of his stocking, but the rest was filled with little toys and candy. I groaned as she handed me a full plate of cookies. Ugh. Why do we always have to make so many again? I joked. Because it's fun! I don't know about you, but when Ronnie and I are making them, a small part of me actually believes they'll be eaten by Father Christmas. She blushed as she placed an amber strand of hair behind her dainty ear. The thick peanut butter cups atop the cookies were killing me that year. I remember choking on my own saliva. Turned into a biting syrup by sugar. We got it done, though. Leaving exactly one cookie uneaten for Ronnie to sneak into the morning. The milk, however, was all mine. We woke to the sounds of sirens and the sun shining through our windows. Nina's bedside clock read 9.18 a.m. As much as I tried to fight it, a cold chill enveloped each cell in my body. We knew something was wrong. It's not normal for Ronnie to sleep past seven, but especially not on Christmas. Nina took off running for his room on instinct, fearing that he'd left the house and gotten hit by a car or injured. I held my breath, praying to hear his sleepy little voice, but so far my wife's calls had gone unanswered. Chris, Ronnie's not here. She yelled down the hall. What do you mean he's not here? You haven't even checked the living room. 
Chris, I'm telling you, our baby's not fucking here. She choked out through sobs. Her footsteps boom through the house, and I hear the front door slam shut as she left. My breath started coming in faster and larger puffs as I tried to process the quickly unfolding situation. The robe I wore the night before was disgusting on my skin. Nothing felt right. It's like, in that moment, I already knew that in the joy in my life was over. I just couldn't accept it. Thousands of scenarios invaded my rationality from the corners I'd done so well at keeping them hidden in. Each fear I've ever had as a parent that was always out of reach for someone like me was now all too tangible. When I opened my front door, I was met with an overwhelming number of sobs and wails. Dozens of people on our street were outside of their homes. Most of them were crying hysterically. Some were blank expressions of shock. Others demanded to search every person's home on the block who didn't have children. I held my wife as she tumbled to the ground. An officer had told her every child in the county had gone missing Christmas Eve night. My brain fought with itself as to how I should feel. On one hand, hundreds of children kidnapped at the same time would be hard to house and even harder to hide. On the other hand, though, the irrational part of my mind told me that something unnatural had happened altogether. And none of us would ever see our children again. As the months went on and the seasons changed, most of the parents in the town had reached the same heart-rendering conclusion. Until this morning. Nina and I are still married, though we sleep in separate bedrooms now. She got on this kick right away about trying for another baby, which I was... am fully against. First off, I felt that if we had another child, we would be replacing Ronnie. Even worse, we'd be accepting the fact that he was never coming back. We didn't know that. I always held out heartbreaking hope that they'd find him. Find all of the missing kids. Secondly, if something in this town was taking children, I certainly don't want to give them a new target. Nina's screams woke me from a heavily medicated sleep. Chris, it's Ronnie! He's home! The covers are thrown in a corner of the room as I spring out of my now cold bed. Each step closer to my son fills my heart with a happiness I feared I no longer possessed. The long-lost and dearly missed sound of his voice stops me cold. Whoever is talking to Nina is not our little boy. His voice sounds low and detached, like it's being run through a voice synthesizer. My stomach heaves when I finally bring myself to finish taking the steps to his bedroom. A mutilated, mangled body lay in the bed that was once meant for our son. Don't get me wrong, he is alive and healthy, he just came back. Wrong. His face is a mingle of features that seem random at best. It was as if Picasso had genetically designed a human being and brought them to life. One leg is shorter than the other by six inches. His left arm is thinner and four shades lighter than his right. The left eye placed haphazardly on his face is one of the only qualities that proves to me it's really him. The eye on the right looks like it belongs to someone else. Entirely. Once again, the street is thick with police officers, but fire rescue is here this time, too. Parents are holding disfigured children as they laid on stretchers, each one yelling about how they're fine and don't need treatment. I caught eyes with this little girl who lived across the street from us, and I recognized one of them as my son's. Whatever happened, it's, it's as if each child was put into a machine, had their DNA all mixed and randomized, then spit back out. The children walk, talk, eat, and play like they always have. It's almost impossible to tell who is who anymore. This Christmas, I'm hearing whispers of a reckoning of sorts. 
The town leaders and religious figures have labeled these children some of their own as abominations. I've heard there will be a massive event to return the children to the melting pot from which they came. I'm writing this as a warning and for proof for Ronnie down the line to know that his dad and mom love him and never regret a single thing about who he is. We're taking him the hell out of here. By the time they notice the child's missing, we will be long gone. Surely there's somewhere in the world that we will greet him with acceptance and love. We're just happy to have him back. Though, I can't help but wonder what surprises Nina and I will wake up to this Christmas Day morning. I'll go on then. Just one more. A short little one to end things off by yours truly. It's dark. Well, I expected it would be dark, but I never imagined it would be this dark. People talk about darkness like it can be quantified, shadowy, black, lightless. And this wasn't like that. This was something more and yet less. Void. It was void dark. A level so beyond human imagination that we barely have the words in any language to describe it. It wasn't even a void. An emptiness beyond language or thought. This couldn't be quantified because there's nothingness. And the nothing cannot be described or compared to a something. This wasn't dark or black or void. This was nothing. Despite being a purely empty nothing, it had a weight, and it was suffocating. I can't breathe, I thought. I'm not supposed to breathe, I responded. I remembered when I was younger. My family always told me about God and the afterlife. They raised me to believe there was life after death, paradise for the righteous, and everlasting torture for the wicked. But I could never truly believe the stories. My church and prayer could never really convince me that the greatest reward was mine for the taking. All I had to do was be a good man and follow the rules, the ones more than a thousand years out of date, based on stories another thousand years older and more. But I had to die to get my reward, and if I wasn't good enough, I go to a place of fire and anguish and torture to burn and scream and cry forever and ever until the end of time. <laughs> they were wrong, but then again, so was I. When I was sixteen, I lost the last shreds of my faith. I became a self-proclaimed atheist. It was my thought that when we die, we just cease to exist. There was no heaven, no hell, no rebirth. My belief was that we just went to sleep and then we just stop existing in our minds. The dead do not feel fear or hurt or joy or sorrow. It is the living, those that remain, that must suffer and move on. But that's not right either. I can't move. Well, of course I couldn't move. It wouldn't make any sense if I could. I can't talk or hear or feel. Those senses were lost to me. Everything was lost to me. Well, almost everything. I still have my thoughts, and that must be the worst part. I'm alone in my head, no feeling, no touch, no sight, nor sound. Alone in the unreachable dark. The only thing left to me were my thoughts and my memory. Oh, my memories. They were so clear now. Before this new existence, I thought my memory was better than most. Certainly better than those closest to me. Yet another thing I was wrong about. Things I thought I remembered correctly were far more inaccurate than I could have thought, and they stretched all the way back to my earliest moments of life. The day I was told I'd be getting a baby sister, and I got so mad because of everyone had been saying it would be a little brother. Oof, I threw a massive fit, and I said I didn't want a sister. I remember the family dog when I was two, a tiny black and white fuzzball yipping at the squirrels through the patio door. My mother's milk, fresh and warm on my tongue, sweet and soothing. 
and a heartbeat thumping in my ears as I floated, cradled in her womb. Oh, I wish I could cry. This damn darkness is the worst. I can't breathe, I can't see, I can't hear, I can't speak. If I'd known it would be this lonely, I would have asked them to cremate me. Well, congratulations for making it to the end. Three hours, you have quite some stamina. <laughs> Well, um, as I said at the start, lots of up-and-coming uh, story narrators here. And, you know, I remember back in the days when I was just getting started. And some of the uh, bigger channels really did give me a helping hand to get out there and um, get my voice heard, so to speak. And um, that's why I keep doing these um, collaborations every now and again. I just enjoy doing it, to be honest. And I remember, like I said, when I was starting out and... The kindness of others was very important, so please, please do as I said, and go check out their channels. Like, subscribe, you know the deal, don't you? <laughs> Give them a bit of support, I'm sure it'll be really, really appreciated. Well, that's it for me this Sunday. A few, of, a few of my stories in there as well, just because I know you like hearing my voice, and it does upset some of you when I have other people on the channel, but well, hey, I think I've just explained why in enough detail. But I'll be back again tomorrow. Some big things coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, my allergies are finally clearing up a bit and I can actually focus properly on the computer screen again, which is nice, as you can imagine. So some biggies. Werewolves are assholes definitely continuing. Some other stories. Uh, creepypasta based on the Last of Us computer game. Really good one. What else? Oh, tons of stuff. Some of the uh, military sci-fi stuff coming up as well. So, stuff to look forward to, I hope. Oh, that is definitely enough for me and my friends for one evening. You have a nice one. Until the next time, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye.